Good morning, everybody, and welcome to this hearing of the Parks and Recreation Committee, the Women's Committee, and your title is very long, Mr. Van Bramer, the Cultural Affairs and something else. Um, my name is Barry Grenenchek. I have the honor of chairing the Parks and Recreation Committee for this term of the New York City Council. Um, I and uh, Councilman Van Bramer are going to waive our opening statements for the time being in terms of uh, just to save some time right now. And uh, we are going to hear first from uh, the Commissioner of Cultural Affairs, a uh, good friend to many of us and former director of the Queens Museum. And he's eager to go. I see that. So I know that uh, you have to be somewhere. So Thank you. Um, we will speak a little later uh, if the clerk uh, can swear him in. And his. Do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth in your testimony before these committees today? Yes, I Thank do. <clears throat> um, I'd like to, to just start by thanking you all for the, <clears throat> uh, the brevity or quickness of getting to my testimony. So I will read my testimony. Good morning, Chairs Van Bramer, Gredenchek, Rosenthal, and members of the respective committees. I'm here to testify on behalf of the Department of Cultural Affairs with regards to today's topic, Improving Gender and Cultural Diversity of Monuments Located in City Parks. I'm joined by a number of colleagues from my agency and from other agencies here. I want to start by saying that the subject of today's hearing is something that the Department of Cultural Affairs, along with colleagues throughout the city government and community partners, have dedicated an enormous amount of time and energy to in recent months. It's a major priority for us, and we thank you for the opportunity to highlight some of the ongoing efforts to address the historic lack of diverse representation in our city's collection of monuments, statues, and public art. Since the Percent for Art program was created under Mayor Koch in 1982, the Department of Cultural Affairs has completed more than 300 permanent public artworks for our open spaces and civic buildings. Thanks to legislation, sponsored by Chair Van Bramer and others, and signed into law by Mayor de Blasio in 2017, Percent for Art has recently been updated. For the first time since the program created, we have updated the uh, budget formula to expand the funding for art commissions. We have also worked with the, uh, you on legislation to enhance community's role in the process. Several monumental works have been commissioned through the Percent for Art. From Alison Sarr's remarkable sculpture of Harriet Tubman in Harlem, to artist Gabriel Koren's depictions of Frederick Douglass and Malcolm X, both also in Harlem, to a monument commemorating Dr. Ronald McNair in Brooklyn, and an installation at New York Public Library's Schom Schomburg Center honoring Langston Hughes. These are examples of incremental progress we've seen in recent years towards a more diverse public art collection. But since 2017, we've been committed to addressing the historic lack of representation for women and people of color in a more urgent and deliberative, deliberate way. Following national protests related to the Confederate monuments and other representations of bigotry and bias in the public realm, Mayor de Blasio established the Mayoral Advisory Commission on City Art Monuments and Markers. Its charge was to, renew, uh, to review controversial items on city-owned property. As DCLA's commissioner, I served as co-chair of the Monuments Commission alongside Darren Walker of the Ford Foundation. We hosted public hearings in all five boroughs to listen to what New Yorkers had to say about representation in our city's public art collection. More than 500 individuals attended these public hearings with nearly 200 offering verbal testimony and an online survey re received more than 3,000 responses. The commission considered several pieces of art on city property that were, that were subject of sustained controversy and worked to formulate recommendations uh, for addressing these in a considered inclusive way. Following the commission's report issued in 2018, January 2018, we embarked on a number of new efforts to make New York City's public spaces more inclusive welcoming and representative of our shared values. For one, Mayor de Blasio ordered the removal of the statue honoring J. Marion Sims, located at the edge of Central Park across from New York Academy of Medicine. <clears throat> Sims performed medical experiments on enslaved black women, and this statue was the focus of sustained community opposition in East Harlem for many years. The statue's removal in April of 2018 marked the beginning of our efforts called Beyond Sims to work with the local community to commission new artwork for the site. We've co-hosted several community discussions to keep the local residents engaged in the art commissioning process and to articulate uh, what, community wants, what the community wants to achieve through this new commission. This past Saturday, we hosted the first of two artist selection panels at the Schomburg Center. 
An artist will be selected at the next panel, which will take place in the weeks ahead. They will be expected to work closely with the community as they design this new monument. <clears throat> also in response to the Mayor, uh, Mayoral Monuments Commission's report, the city's Public Design Commission hired two archivists to undertake a one-year extensive review of the city's art collection. If we want to address the issues of representation in public land, we first need to have a clear sense of who is currently represented. The first phase of this project will result in a public online database of outdoor monuments and memorials and is planned for completion in August 2019. We are moving ahead with several fronts while that effort is underway. The Mayor's Monuments Commission emphasized that we should focus on an additive approach, finding ways to honor people, histories, and voices that are currently underrepresented or not represented at all in our city's public spaces. One of the most exciting and concrete outgrowths of this effort is She Built NYC, an initiative spearheaded by First Lady Shirley McRae and Deputy Mayor Alicia Glenn to commission permanent artwork honoring women. This is an area of particularly stark and troubling statistics of 118 unique individuals represented in commemorative sculptures in city parkland, most of which date from the 19th and early 20th century, just four are women. An open call for nominations of women or groups of women that the public wanted to see honored yielded thousands of responses and enormous amount of enthusiasm for the project overall. Building on this public engagement and momentum, in November, we were thrilled to be part of the announcement that Shirley Chisholm would be the first woman to be honored as part of She Built NYC. The trailblazing public servant from Brooklyn will have a monument installed at the Parkside entrance of Prospect Park by the end of 2020. This is just the beginning of our efforts to cultivate a more diverse collection of city monuments, and we plan to announce more in the near future. Following the Monuments Commission report, the mayor also committed to honoring indigenous people of New York. We're in active conversation with members of the community on ways to accomplish this important gesture to honor the people who lived here before Europeans arrived. As you can see from all this activity, this is an exciting time to be involved in the work of bringing new ideas, energy, and voices into the process of commissioning public monuments. We look forward to sharing updates about our new commissions with you and general public in the near future. Your support is an essential complement of, uh, component of these efforts. As we hope today's testimony makes clear, the city has demonstrated its strong commitment to the values and objectives that are reflected in the proposed legislation, and we believe that there are ways we can work together to achieve them. I thank you uh, for giving me the opportunity to testify before today's hearing. Thank you, Commissioner. Um, uh, to open up questions, I'm going to call on uh, Chair Van Bramer. We've been joined uh, by Joe Borelli of Staten Island and also Peter Koo uh, from the borough of Queens. Thank you. You can uh, Commissioner, I thought you were staying till 1030, no? Okay. Um, Well, let me just say, I think that's highly unusual, and I'm, uh, we understood that the commissioner had a, a hard stop at 10.30, um, but uh, did not realize that that meant that he would refuse to take any questions. I realize that uh, Kendall and others are here, but um, I think that abrupt uh, turn of events is surprising and highly unusual and unfortunate, but nevertheless, we will persist. Um, so uh, with that, why don't uh, my co-chair uh, speak uh, and uh, have some other folks testify. Uh, thank you, Chair Van Bramer. We've also been joined by um, Councilman Rafael Salamanca uh, from the Great Borough of the Bronx. At this time, uh, Matt, do you have testimony? No. Okay, so we don't have any testimony. So. Um, I'm going to let uh, now uh, my, my co-chair, uh, Van Bremer, open up the uh, line of questions this morning. Thank you. Thank you very much. I, I just confirmed with our council that we had, in fact, been told that the commissioner had a hard stop at 1030 uh, and uh, did not know that uh, he would refuse to take any questions here at this hearing, which is uh, galling to me. But I believe we have to swear in uh, the others who are going to testify today. So. I'll hand it over to our council to do that. Do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth in your testimony today? I do. I do. I do. I do. Thank you. 
Uh, for anybody who'd like to testify, I have a bunch, but if you'd like to testify this morning, um, please, if you haven't done so already, please see the Sergeant at Arms. Thank you. Councilman, uh, Chairman Van Bramer. Thank you very much, uh, Chair. So, um, you know, I want to thank my co-chairs, obviously, uh, Chair Gradenchik and Chair Rosenthal, who will be joining us. And there she is, uh, Chair Rosenthal, uh, for this very important uh, hearing uh, that unfortunately the Commissioner of Cultural Affairs could only stay for 13 minutes at. Um, so um, uh, I want to uh, say that the remembrances that we have in our city are incredibly important, and it's also incredibly important that they accurately reflect our society clearly we have not done so and uh, the efforts to correct that are worthy and important uh, and that's why we're having this hearing in part our uh, parks and our city's uh, civic structures deserve to have monuments that uh, speak to who we are and obviously with a city that is over 50 percent uh, comprised of women uh, with less than 2% of the monuments um, uh, reflecting uh, that important part of our population. Um, so some efforts are underway, but more uh, are needed, and we have some pieces of legislation uh, that have been introduced. And were the commissioner here, I would uh, uh, continue to uh, ask him, as we did in private, um, but it's important that these conversations be transparent and public as well. Um, where we're at, and I think Kendall, that, that responsibility, responsibility for the Department of Cultural Affairs falls to you, but obviously Parks and, and the Public Design Commission and others are represented here as well, so we'll get to uh, uh, those folks. But uh, I sort of am. <laughs> uh, so, I guess I would say, um, uh, uh, Kendall, maybe it's helpful if you uh, introduce yourself, uh, but um, where is the administration and why is the administration so tentative about this issue? Why, w there seems to be a lot of trepidation on the part of the commissioner to talk openly about this issue, which is one that I am sure in his heart, I know Tom Finkelpearl, uh, that he is a, a good and decent and progressive person um, and wants, you know, only the best of things to happen here. But there seems to be a lot of trepidation uh, on the part of the department to talk about this, um, uh, both in what you've done and what you're doing. Maybe you can clear that up right here since the commissioner had to run out of the room literally after he gave his testimony. Okay. And uh, yeah, so um, I'm Kendall Henry, the director of the Percent Fraud Program, and uh, we're tasked with um, commissioning any of the works that move forward as uh, uh, permanent art or, or monuments. And um, I don't know that there's trepidation. I mean, we support the spirit of the legislation, and I think um, like when we worked with the Percent for Art, um, we knew le legislation with Percent for Art, there's a lot of conversation, and we welcome that, so. But where, where, um where are you at in terms of uh, meaningfully addressing the inequity that exists? Mm -hmm. uh, where, is, where is the department, where is the commissioner in that debate and then that discussion? Is it a, is it a funding issue? Is it um, a process issue? Where are you? And, and do you think that it is a worthy goal for 50% of our monuments uh, to be those of, of women, is that something the department believes or does not believe? Yeah, we support, we support you know, the legislation, we support the idea of it, of course. Um, and we are starting with, um, with the, for example, with the She Built initiative, and, um, and right now we are working on um, the Shirley Chisholm, like the commissioner mentioned in his testimony, and uh, we are approaching that in, a, in, in many different ways in terms of having equity within the artists that we look at uh, in, in terms of the artists, the, the panelists that we, we convene to select those artists and, um, and so we're gonna continue that. Are any of these projects funded and if so, where is the funding, which agency might it be located? 
So um, as part of the mayor's initiative, he had funded the, the, the initiation of, of new monuments um, and we're using that funding, so it does exist. So for example, the Charlie Chisholm uh, monument we're doing, we do have funding for that. Um, we've just been working on the Beyond Sims, which is the project we're using to replace the J. Merriam Sims that was removed. We have funding for that as well, and so, so we do have funding for those projects, yes. And how much funding was that? The, the mayor has allocated 10 million in the next million uh, four years. Yes. Over how many years? Four years. Over four years. Yes. Um, and do you have a sense of how many statues you can erect with that $10 million? Um, it's hard to say. Uh, a lot of things go into play in terms of what the cost of a monument might be from the location and um, having the, the site preparation, the materials that's used, uh, the scale, the si you know, all these things go into play in terms of how much it costs for a monument. Uh, so it's hard to say. But a lot of uh, general, uh, general scale would be uh, at least half a million and, and above for any given monument. So it's hard to tell how many we could do with the 10 million that we do have. And uh, of the $10 million, is, is some of that part of the percent for art program or is all of that new money? That's all new money. All new money, yes. none from, okay. Um, uh, so with the, the Shirley Chisholm uh, statue in particular, obviously you must have a cost estimate because that's fairly far along, right? And that's mm -hmm. obviously a beautiful thing, but how much do you have a, any sense of what that will cost? So for that monument, we've allocated up to one million for the project. And, um, and so right now the artists are working on their proposals and they, w they're gonna come in with the proposals on, uh, on April 1st and we'll get a better idea of, of how much they'll cover for that amount. And, and what's the coordination between uh, all of you with respect to any one of these, right? I mean, if it's on Parks property, obviously you've, you've got Parks and then PDC, you have to uh, uh, weigh in here, right? And, and essentially approve uh, any of these, right? Um, so maybe uh, each of you or, or one of you can talk to the, the coordination, but PDC at, at, at a certain point, you have to vote, your, your board has to vote to approve anything, or you could vote to disapprove, I suppose. All right, that's correct. So as a matter of process, we wanted to be clear that the, uh, sorry, Just Justin Moore, executive yourself, yeah. director of the Public Design Commission. Uh, we wanted to be clear that uh, the PDC does not initiate the, the proposals, the projects, that happens through uh, uh, the various city agencies uh, based on, on their jurisdiction. So uh, parks for parks department, transportation for streets and plazas, et cetera. Uh, so that the initiating, the commissioning of the artwork happens um, uh, through that process and through the agencies. Once an artist is uh, selected and a, and a design is, has been developed, it moves forward to the Public Design Commission for an early uh, conceptual review. Um, there's often a, a kind of an iterative design process uh, with feedback on proposals. Uh, you know, we see nearly a thousand projects a year uh, citywide, but typically only one, maybe two, uh, that are uh, artworks of this nature. Uh, yeah, and, and uh, Matt Drury, Director of Government Relations, uh, New York City Parks. Uh, specific to our role is sort of, you know, in this case, you know, property uh, owner with jurisdiction over the actual site. You know, we work very, very closely, uh, obviously, with, with Department of Cultural Affairs as they're going to administer. And, you know, in the future moving forward, as other projects sort of that come out of the Monuments Commission uh, or she built NYC specifically, you know, if those are, you know, uh, determined to be cited or if it's to be explored that they're to be cited on Parkland, we'd obviously work very, very closely with uh, both uh, DCLA and then as the project moves through the approval process, uh, PDC as well. And uh, so let me just be sure, Kendall, I got you right, because you said you support the legislation. So does the Department of Cultural Affairs, uh, are, you, are you prepared to say, and are you saying on behalf of the commissioner and the administration that you support the legislation that, that is before us? We support the spirit of the legislation, and, uh, and this is something that we've been, we've been doing already, so yes. Okay, so supporting the spirit and then yes are supporting the spirit. Two different things. Um, uh, the yes at the end of it 
would would seem to indicate that you do, but the spirit is a little bit less concrete, I suppose. Not necessarily. Support the spirit, but again, with, with more conversation and, and back and forth and speaking and, and discussing is important. Got it, okay. Um, uh, uh, look, I think it's a little unfair that you're, um, as, as Kenny is approaching you from behind, I think it's a little uh, unfortunate that you are um, uh, put in the position in this very strange circumstance where the commissioner literally ran out of the room. Um, so I'm, I'm not going to um, uh, belabor the point, um, just to say that it's very, very disappointing. Um, uh, and I'm not directing that to you, but to uh, the, the, uh, the commissioner, really, and the administration who uh, told us a certain set of circumstances would exist here today, and then when we, we bypassed our opening statements intentionally so that we could actually hear from the commissioner uh, and address some of the questions, because we knew he only had until 10.30, that after he read his opening statement, he literally ran out of the room, and that's completely unacceptable, and I've, this is my 10th year as a council member, and I have never seen that happen. Um, in 10 years, and uh, we count the number of committee meetings that I've attended uh, over the 10 years, and it's well over a 1,000, um, and I've never seen a commissioner run out of the room like that. Um, so just shocked uh, that that would occur. So I have more uh, uh, questions, I, but I, I know that we have other chairs to hear from and other folks who may want to uh, ask questions uh, while we have the team assembled here. Thank you, Chair Van Bramer. I am going to deliver uh, my opening remarks now, and we had put them off, and I am uh, disappointed as well um, that uh, my friend Tom Finkel-Pearl could not stick around to answer at least a few questions. I want to put that on the record. Um, I want to thank uh, Councilwoman uh, Rosenthal for being uh, the inspiration for this hearing, and I want to thank uh, Chair Van Bramer as well uh, for agreeing to hold this very important hearing. Um, our city prides itself on many things, including its rich history and cultural diversity, diversity, both of which have helped to cement our status as the capital of the world. One of the many ways we commemorate that history and diversity is through the dedication of various monuments, statues, and memorials. Sadly, if you were to take a look at the statues that honor historical figures, you would not come away with a feeling that they reflect the city's diversity. In fact, there are over 250 sculptures on city property, 125 of which are based on historical figures, and of that total, only five, yes, five of those statues depict women, not counting Alice in Wonderland statue in Central Park. Uh, since that number is so small, it is easy for me to name them all. There's Joan of Arc in Riverside Park. Golda Meir is on Broadway and 39th Street. Gertrude Stein uh, is located in Bryan Park. Eleanor Roosevelt is also in Riverside Park. And Harriet Tubman is on St. Nicholas Avenue in West 122nd Street. I want to note that we as a city uh, are doing all we can to welcome our diverse um, population I represent um, one of the most diverse districts in Queens, which is uh, the most diverse county in the United States of America. But it is sad to say that when it comes to our monuments, we would be hard pressed to be less diverse even if we were trying to be. Uh, the process to approve uh, any work of art on city property can be involved and arduous. Basically, if a proposed monument would be on Parks property, it involves Parks Department reviewing a proposal for any art installation that will permanently be installed on public property. DPR works with sponsors to refine a, refine a proposed design and determine a location. And if it is approved, determine whether the proposal complies with other city rules, such as those issued by Landmarks Preservation. After that, they make a formal submission to the Public Design Commission. Uh, PDC will ho then hold what is referred to as a committee meeting with stakeholders of the proposed installation at the committee meeting, agencies can receive feedback on design proposals before the proposals are submitted to the full commission, although the PDC does not vote on projects and does not accept public testimony at that time. Ultimately, if the committee meeting results in a positive outcome for the proposal, a public meeting will occur at which public testimony is presented and the full commission votes. I am not making this up, I assure you. Under C PDC's guidelines, 
PDC discourages monuments and memorials for people, places, and events that have been recognized as significant for less than 20 years unless they are of exceptional importance and will not consider monuments to living persons. Perhaps it is time we consider changing some of the guidelines to allow for far more diversity. The two bills that we are hearing today attempt to adjust the process with the goal of greater inclusivity in our monuments, and uh, Councilman uh, Van Bramer has talked about that. We'll hear from um, Chair uh, Rosenthal in a second, and then we will hear from uh, Councilman Salamanca as well on his bill. It is long past due that the city engage in a holistic approach to addressing our diversity deficiency when it comes to our monuments. And I'm pleased that we have initiatives like She Built New York and Create New York City to uh, lead us in the direction. However, there are some issues and questions regarding these initiatives that we need to address today. And again, I am disappointed that uh, Commissioner Finkelpearl left um, because he is the Commissioner of Cultural Affairs. Um, and I would have loved to hear his insight. He's been on the uh, cultural uh, scene in this city for decades. I look forward to examining uh, all of these issues today and I welcome all of those who have come to testify. At this time, I would like to call upon Chair Rosenthal for her opening statement, and then we will hear from uh, Councilman Salamanca. Thank you so much, Chair Grudenchek. Um, I share your concerns about the commissioner making a statement and leaving. Um, I'm sure his staff is incredibly able, and we're all, um, you know, of course, happy you're here, but <clears throat> it makes a statement, I think, that the commissioner chose um, not to be here when uh, he had ample time to change his schedule. Uh, it was our understanding that he was going to be here at least for half an hour, delivered his speech for 15 minutes and then left. Um, it it uh, reflects to me a lack of um, engagement with the public. This is the opportunity here at an oversight hearing. This is an opportunity for the city to say, you know, enough is enough going forward, all statues and we're going to lean in and make a lot more will be of people of color and of, you know, non-white men. Um, and uh, I'm, I'm really disappointed that he would get up and leave. I'm gonna read my statement, but I'm sorry it will fall uh, not on the commissioner's ears. Um, and I'm sorry that, I, <clears throat> I would like to think this issue is being taken seriously. I would like to think that it's not because of this hearing that you had a meeting to discuss possible artists on the Sims statue on Saturday. Um, so here we go. Uh, I'm Council Member Helen Rosenthal, Chair of the Committee on Women, um, and I'm pleased to be here uh, with my co-chairs, Barry Gudenchek and Jimmy Van Bramer. Um, public statues and monuments are selective windows into our past. The decisions of what to do to commemorate are reflective of our society's values and aspirations. As my colleagues have mentioned in their statements and comments New York, in New York City, women, trans, and gender nonconforming individuals are underrepresented, if at all, among public statues and monuments. Um, and in fact, there are presently only five monuments that honor historic women in our public spaces in Central Park in my district. There are over 20 statues of white men but not one statue of a female historical figure, although there is a historically accurate statue of a dog. People of color and those with disabilities fare no better, and it's time to right that wrong. And it shouldn't be so hard. But for nearly a decade, including the last five years, um, community members, I should say not the last year, but four years prior to that, community members in East Harlem fought to have the statue of Dr. J. Marion Sims, known as the father of gynecology, removed from Central Park 
for over a decade. This should not be so hard. Dr. Sims earned this moniker while brutally experimenting on black women and white women, although they may have been given anesthesia. All of them were poor, and that's why they could be experimented on. Um, and of course, it was without their full consent or even, for the most part, anesthesia. In my mind, the Sims statue unjustly honored the racism, misogyny, and oppression that tragically is a part of our history. Now, I am grateful to the Harlem community for initiating uh, this fight, and I was proud to stand with them last April as we pushed for and eventually witnessed the statue's removal. However, let's be clear, the uh, podium on which it stood still stands. And uh, when I get to my questioning part, I'd like to hear from you what the plaque on that podium says. Because it certainly doesn't make reference to any uh, of the um, crimes that our dear doctor committed um, and does not speak to the exact next steps of what's happening. So it's been almost a full year. And from the perspective of the public, all we see is uh, a pedestal. Um, it's very disappointing. Monuments matter, and they are prompts for discussion about histor history and justice. They are opportunities for one generation to transmit a sense of cultural history, meaning, purpose, and values to the next. As a city, we must aim for thoughtfulness and inclusion. We cannot stand for the erasure of the contributions of so many dynamic and monumental individuals. Just as importantly, we cannot hide or cover up difficult and at times shameful truths about those that we've memorialized. Um, and I just want to give a shout out to the artist who posted a, um, um, a, a picture of her art of three women in hospital gowns on a um, shade with blood all over their hospital gowns and put that as if that were above the pedestal. I thought that was brilliant and reflected history accurately. Um, that's my two cents. So much work remains to address the challenge to bring greater honesty and equity to our public monuments. Evolving cultural monuments challenge us to reconsider what was previously deemed accessible, acceptable and virtuous. We saw this most recently with the spray painting of hashtag me too on the unconditional surrender statue in Florida, memorializing a forced kiss at the victory parade at the end of World War II. This public dialogue and questioning is overdue must be welcomed, we must continue to shine a spotlight, spotlight on this. And today's hearing is an opportunity to learn from the public about how we can bring greater diversity to our public monuments. We refuse to continue ignoring history and history. And I'm grateful to all who wish to change and enter this dialogue. Um, I want to thank Ned Terrace, my legislative director, as well the, as the Committee on Women staff for their work in preparing for this hearing, Brenda McKinney, our general counsel, Chloe Rivera, legislative policy and analyst, and Monica People, our finance analyst. Um, again, I just, uh, I was hoping for a lot more. I was hoping we could have a declarative statement from the commissioner making it clear that, uh, that he is full on willing to no longer put up statues of white men until we are in an equal position of people of color and women and that we would lean in to make that happen. And a million dollars here and a million dollars there just doesn't cut it for me. Um, thank you, Chair Gridencheck for the time to speak.
Thank you, Chair Rosenthal. I'm going to call on Chair Van Bramer now to uh, read the pieces of legislation, and then we will hear uh, from Councilman Salamanca. We have been joined by our majority leader, Lori Cumbo, who recently celebrated a birthday. And I want to wish her a happy birthday because I didn't see her that day, and I am not going to ask her how old she is. <coughs> Thank you very much, uh, Chair. First, let me just say uh, thank you to Chair Rosenthal for that uh, incredibly passionate and important statement, and of course, for her ongoing work um, on behalf of all uh, women and people in the city of New York. So uh, just so that we are clear and it's on the record, uh, intro 1114 uh, is a local law related to creating a task force to examine the monuments, statues, public art, and historical markers on city-owned property sponsored by Councilmember Inez Barron. I'm happy to be the second on that piece of legislation with her. Uh, I know Councilmember Barron feels very passionately about this and helping us to understand sure, the current landscape and artwork that might be inconsistent with the values of diversity, equity, and inclusion that we hold dear uh, in the city. Uh, introduction 1439, and you'll hear from uh, the prime sponsor, uh, Council Member Salamanca, and of course, Chair Rosenthal. Uh, that is a local law uh, that would require the Public Design Commission to ensure that women are depicted in at least 50% of approved works. And I believe that Council Member Salamanca is here and will speak to this important piece of legislation now. Thank you, uh, Chair Van Bramer and uh, Chair Gredenchik and Chair Rosenthal. I am um, today. I'm, I'm excited that um, you will be hearing my bill 1439, which will require the New York City Public Design Commission to ensure that 50% of all work or works of art installed or built in city-owned land depict non-fictional women. Um, and just to point out some details here, of the 150 monuments or statues in city-owned property, there's only five that are of uh, of, of women. In Central Park, there are 12 dozen statues, and none of them were of living women. But you have Alice in Wonderland, Balto, the dog, Mother Goose, and Romeo and Juliet, which I find it unacceptable. And so my bill, uh, 1439, will require that moving forward, any statues, arts, any sculptures uh, being approved by the department the Public Design Commission will require that 50% 50, 50 of these monuments or statues are of women. So with that, I want to thank uh, this committee for allowing me to, uh, to have this bill heard. Thank you, um, Councilman uh, Salamanca. We have been joined also by Councilwoman Diana Ayala from the Borough of Manhattan and also the Borough of Bronx. She crosses the river, so to speak. Um, at this time, I would like to call upon uh, my colleague uh, and co-chair of this hearing, uh, Helen Rosenthal, to ask some questions. Thank you so much, Chair Gredenchek, and thank you so much, uh, Councilmember Salamanca, for your legislation, okay, and Councilmember Barron as yeah. well. Um, yeah. I just wanted to, uh, of course, thank you for being here. Um, and I want to start with what is, on, what is the plaque that's on the podium that was left behind. The cons. Uh, I'm going to re uh, refer to my colleague uh, here, Kendall, from uh, DCLA, to talk a little bit about the efforts that are underway, the, what we call the Beyond Sims uh, so project. So I'm aware of the efforts that are underway. I'm just asking a simple question. What are the words on the plaque? Yeah, I don't have that text. I, I apologize. I don't have that text with me, and uh, we can we can get back to you. That's okay. Uh, I don't have that text with me. I, I'd be happy to get that to you. I don't have that with me. Okay, we're going to be here for like at least another hour. Do you think that there's someone back at the office who might have it, who could text you the words, and you could report on that at this hearing? Surely there was someone who made it, who's back at the office, who can just sort of forward over what the plaque says. Uh, 
I'm reading off a photo here, so it's a little fuzzy, so uh, as I believe it reads, by order of Mayor Dil de Blasio, NYC Parks has re relocated the statue of Dr. James Marison Sims to Greenwood Cemetery in Brooklyn, where Sims is buried. Uh, plans are being developed to commission a new monument on this site. I believe that's what reads on the plaque there. And I would ask that you update that plaque as the community asked on that April day in 2018 to be a little more informational about why the statue is no longer there. And uh, I think that in and of itself is an important message to the people who walk by, right? Because right now it's just a pretty boring description. Um, technically it's true, but this is a community that fought for 10 years to get it down. Really, you couldn't come up with one or two empathetic words, or, or is Parks just refusing to play a, a role? I, I think we're being deferential to the process that's in place now to, re to replace the work. I think the history of what happened, I think, I don't want to speak for what, you know, the artist that gets selected or the process that will play itself out, but I think we, we, we presume that that will obviously be an important context that's provided when the work's re replaced. I think that's waiting too long. That's my opinion. It's been a year. Uh, it could be five more years before a statue is put up. You haven't told me a deadline, unless you have a deadline of when it's actually going to be done. But that still, again, doesn't get to the point of leaning in. I mean, if the mayor was willing to have a commission to study whether or not these statues were going to stay up, he can't take the extra mile of making a statement on uh, the podium of a statue that was taken down clearly because it was represented the racism and misogyny of that time. You made the decision to mm -hmm. take it down, no? Yeah, I mean, I think we can take this back to our to our respective uh, agencies and no, discuss no, no, you know, interim signage. It, on that day, this is what the community asked. So, I mean, taking it back now, you know, it's a little cute by half, right? I mean, you knew. I, I want to hear, this is what I want to hear. I want to hear that you'll work with the community this month, come up with the wording, and have it installed by the end of next month. Why, why is that so hard? You were able to have a plaque installed on that day. So could you do that? And could you get back to this committee on when you expect an appropriate statue to be placed there? Can I? Uh, yeah, sorry. It's insulting mm -hmm. to the community. You need to be aware. And I mean, it troubles me that you weren't aware. But it is insulting to the East Harlem community, the plaque that's up there now. Yeah, um, so since the, pl since the statue was removed, we have um, been working with the East Harlem community, um, community boards, and um, a couple of the organizations that fought the many years to remove it to come up with a process um, that would guide how we look at what replaces the Sims statue. Um, we started with a what we call a healing process. To so I'm just asking two things. I really, this is not a time to filibuster, and we have so many more people who want to ask questions, so I don't want to eat up all the time. I'm asking you two things. Would you be willing to go back to the community board this month and ask them what language they think would be appropriate on the statue for right now? My guess is they're writing it as we speak. And would you commit to installing that plaque on the podium in the next two months. May I ask you, I think it's appropriate and good that you have a process for the replacement and you should continue that process. But you did not talk to the community about what the replacement plaque should be in the time being and I'm asking that you make a commitment to talk to the community board that's very well versed in this issue and agree to put what they want on the plaque on the plaque. 
I mean, I think I'm prepared. I don't want to speak for my colleagues here, but I think we're prepared to absolutely hear more from the community and make sure that we can get, you know, we can explore interim signage. I'm not prepared to, you know, I can't, you know, in terms of the conditions and the, the timeline, I think it's hard to do that, but I think it's absolutely important to engage. Uh, They've been engaged up to this point you, and can you we're absolutely willing to work to with them on that. Can you have the actual replacement statue up in a year? We can't build a bathroom in a year. So the, the process takes a little bit of time um, and just um, going through. And keep in mind, you've been going at it for a year. So yes, it takes time. Although the community, I think, knows what they want now. So that's a whole nother story. So again. You wanna say two years, five years? Just tell me what it is. What year did you put the money in the budget for? The, the budget is not in a specific year. Um, it's. I mean, that's how the budget works. Okay, but anyway, so the process is that we speak to the community first then we discuss what um, a healing process, then what, what they think, what, what's, what some of the issues that they want the, the replacement artwork to, to address. Then we had a artist selection process um, on Saturday where we narrowed down a list of about 54 artists to about five. And these artists are now going to meet with the community again to sort of hear a different, um, uh, from individuals within the committee that we formed then those artists are going to go back and have about eight weeks to come up with a proposal. Uh, then we're gonna do an exhibition of those proposals to the community and then the artists are gonna, so there's a, it's, it's, a, it's a very long process. Just the fabrication of any kind of work takes a, a number of, of, uh, of, of many months. Just the review process that the piece has to go through with PDC takes at least, um, at least two, three months. Uh, okay, so, it's just, so it's just, I know, really, standard. I mean, I, I apologize for interrupting, and I know you're doing your job, and this is really just an institutional dialogue. I don't, I'm really kind of a nice person, but, and I'm sure you are too, most of the time. Most of the time. But um, I'm, I just want to say I'm really disappointed that you can't answer my question, and um, I think the community, I would just want to reflect that I think the community is sick of, um, you know, there being one reason or another for not just moving on this. I'm glad you have a process. I would ask that you speed your process up and that you know the end date of your process. Um, and I would, you know, at least ask for a commitment to that. Maybe getting back to us with an end date. We'll get back to you. Mm -hmm. um, I just wanna compare that process actually to what's going on with the selection of the Shirley Chisholm statue uh, that she built, NYC says is its first project. Um, so in that uh, situation, um, you put out an RFP and there are gonna be panels reviewing it, but in the RFP, it doesn't even mention Shirley Chisholm and I'm wondering why and how you expect there to be responses that will answer the call for Charlie Chisholm at that site, unless I'm wrong, you tell me. Yeah, so, so we did an RFQ, a request for qualifications for any artists who would be interested in doing um, uh, monuments in New York City. And so that's how we began with the Shirley Chisholm project. And then we, re we issued the RFQ to um, request for specific um, artists who specifically wanted to work on Shirley Chisholm's project. That's gone out or not yet? That has been out before. Um, it has been out for about a couple months. And so we passed that process. So we passed you, that component of the process. So you first did who wants to do monuments? And did, is that part of also what we're talking about for the replacement of the misogynist racist Sims statue? Yeah. So was it, that part of just who wants to do monuments and you got 54 back? So when we first started the She Built initiatives, uh, initiative, we didn't have specific um, women identified yet, but we just wanted to make sure that the word was out that we'll need, we were looking for artists. Then when it was announced that it would be a Shirley Chisholm monument, we reissued the RFQ, um, identifying that this particular uh, woman will be uh, memorialized. And, and so it ex we extended that, that um, the RFQ. So there was two, two phases of the RFQ, one for a general and then one for a specific to Shirley Chisholm. When's that due back? So that was done already. So yeah. with the Shirley How Chisholm. How many responses did you get for the Shirley Chisholm statue? 
So we, we, we got about 134. For Shirley Chisholm in particular? For the whole, we just opened it up again. So we started with a general, and then we said Shirley Chisholm would be the first one. So if you wanted to add your name to the general list, then uh, please submit your, your information. <clears throat> and so that was done, um, uh, it, it was closed, I think, on the late, this, the 21st of December. And we had our first panel looking at a lot of these artists on um, the early January, and we selected five artists uh, who are now working on the proposal for Shirley Chisholm, the Shirley Chisholm monument. Over 100 applied to that, and now you have five who are working on the Shirley Chisholm, and over 54 applied for the Sim statue, and now you have how many working on it? Five as well? We literally just selected them on Saturday, yeah. and they have not even been identified or I mean, contacted yet, um, but yes, we, we were looking for five proposals for, for that um, okay. monumental. Okay, I um, got it. Okay, well, I'm glad you're looking at Shirley Chisholm now as well. Um, could you uh, explain to me the, I'm just gonna ask two more, two more questions and turn it over to my colleagues. And this is about the relationship between She Built NYC and Women.NYC and DCLA. Um, uh, is Women.NYC a government entity? I, I don't have any information on Women.NYC. Who does She Built and She Built NYC is an arm of what government entity? She Built NYC is an initiative. Is what? It's an initiative. Under uh, the jurisdiction of which agency? So as cultural, as the Department of Cultural Affairs percent for our program, we're tasked with commissioning the work. Um, so the, the She Built Initiatives was, I, I think, if correct me if I'm wrong, was initiated by the First Lady and the Deputy Mayor um, as a, a means to really focus on uh, the women's monuments. Uh, and so, and so we, we are tasked with with that um, initiative to commission the works. So the money comes out of what budget? The money comes out of the, the budget that the mayor has identified, the 10 million. Um, Where is it stored right now? Uh, the money is, each year we get uh, about a 2.5, uh, two two, 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 yeah, 2.5 million dollars uh, within our budget to um, realize those those um, monuments. I'm sorry, just I just want to articulate it. Our is Department of Parks or Department of Cultural Affairs? Department of Cultural Affairs. Okay, cultural affairs. so cultural affairs every year, if I were to open up the budget last year, the year before, there's always 2.5% of some number that's in your budget that's for art. So 2.5 million for the next oh, four 2. years. Oh, 2.5 million, my yes. bad. Oh, so is this additional funds that have been put in your budget? You said yes. That's correct. What's the usual amount that's in there? Uh, cult in cultural affairs budget? Yeah. I'm not, I don't know our budget like that, I'm sorry. So right now, or five years ago, if I were to say, do you have any money in your budget for monuments, historic plaques, what would you have said? I would say no. You would said zero. So this is brand new money? That's correct that's been put in, and the first fiscal year is what year of the 2.5 million? Yeah, I'll have to double check, but I think it's uh, 2018? Yeah, yeah is this, this current fiscal year, 2018, 19. Sorry, you have to get back to me as to which fiscal year? And I just got the information, it's 2019. 2019, fiscal year 19, mm -hmm. you have 2.5 million. Fascinating, and how are you spending that 2.5 million? Uh, we started with uh, She Built NYC, Shirley Chisholm, and the um, Beyond um, Sims. My guess is, I think the answer to the question is, you're gonna roll over what you don't use into the next year, or does it go away? Because you're not spending 2.5 yeah. on She Built this year. It does roll over, yes. Okay. And you've spent maybe a couple hundred thousand on putting out RFQs. No, that is that, that soft money or is that part of the capital? That's not that's not capital. That's soft money. That's not capital. So you're not spending any of the 2.5 this year. 
And we have a guarantee from the administration that's rolling over. Will that roll over as the full 2.5 in fiscal year 20 or roll over evenly? As far as I know, it's going to be rolling over. Evenly or into simply 2020, fiscal year 20? I'll have to get back to you on those details. Okay, it's important and just given that you know, you have one more slice of this apple um, by June. If you could forecast how you're going to spend the money instead of putting it in evenly over four years, I think it's part of the statement that you're making to the public. And the idea, yeah, it's my two cents. Um, and so just to confirm, there's no relationship between DCLA and women.nyc? Or is there one with the Commission on Gender Equity? just trying to see how, who's gonna drive the bus for She Built NYC after this administration leaves in, in 2021, when by the way, two thirds of the money will still be left unspent in the budget? I will get back to you on that information. It's pretty important. I mean, is it gonna stay in DCLA? And uh, could the next mayor take it out? How quickly are you moving to get this work done to guarantee it'll happen under the de Blasio administration? I'll take that as a we haven't thought about it. Oh, I apologize. No, I, I just I was just thought you were just keep talking, but um, we haven't a tentative schedule, and um, and yeah, we are trying to complete those at least the Sheepville NYC Shirley Chisholm and the Beyond Sims by uh, the end of 2020. So again, here's why it's so important, because I don't know what website you're talking about as having put out the RFQs or whatever. Right now on women.nyc, it talks about uh, if you're interested in creating a public monument that honors women's history, please apply. Deadline to submit is December 21, 2018, and there's a link to apply. There's no update for that whatsoever. I'm looking through it. So that's why it's so important what the coordination is. I'm not just asking to bust your chops. I'm asking to understand how the public could know that you're serious in terms of doing this. It's not coordinated with the group that's putting out the call. So that RFP, RFQ, was put out to select for the, the artwork that we've already selected. Yeah, I look, if you could put out some sort of diagram explaining how all this is connected and how you're gonna guarantee that this money is gonna be spent on uh, statues for women, that would be really helpful. Um, thank you very much. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. I think Councilman Chairman Van Bramer wants to make a quick statement yes. and then we're going to get to uh, Councilman Borelli. I just want to say, because uh, Chair Rosenthal is rightfully asking a lot of really important questions, but I know you, uh, Kendall, uh, to be a very thoughtful uh, and intelligent uh, uh, administrator of the Present for Art program. But this is the problem with this administration, is, is you are for forced to take the hot seat and to receive yep. a lot of questions, some of which you don't actually know the answers to and you aren't expected because you're the director of the Percent for Art program of the Department of Cultural Affairs. But we had the commissioner of the Department of Cultural Affairs here and he literally ran out of the room at 1013, literally ran out of the room not to take questions. This is not point, supposed to be a really difficult and intense hearing. It's about an issue that virtually all of us agree on, right? That virtually everybody in the administration could agree on. But this hearing, from your perspective, is bungled. Sorry. Because the commissioner runs out and leaves really good folks, like you, Kendall, and others, to get grilled on questions, many of which you don't know the answer to. And it's unfair to you, and it's unfair to us, and I don't know why this administration, whoever in this administration, told Commissioner Finkelpearl, you are not to answer any questions about this topic. It's outrageous, and I'm not directing this to any one of you. You all are doing your jobs, representing your agencies, in the case of uh, uh, Justin, uh, who runs uh, a department here in this administration, but it's completely unnecessary for us to be in this position, for the chair, 
uh, Rosenthal not to be able to get answers, and for you, Kendall, to be put in the position, quite frankly. Tom Finkelpearl is the commissioner of the Department of Cultural Affairs, should be here to answer these damn questions, and I just had to say that on the record before I know other council members have questions. Thank you, chairs. Um, we have been joined uh, by several council members. Uh, Councilmember Mark Levine from Manhattan. Uh, I gotta take my glasses off. Uh, my leader, Karen Kozlowitz from Queens, uh, Andrew Cohn from the Bronx, and uh, Francisco Moya from the Borough of Queens. At this time, uh, from the far reaches of New York City, Councilman Joe Borelli. Thank you, Chairman Gradenchik. Uh, my question's for the Public Design Commission, and it's a little bit off topic. Um, you know, we, we, the other agencies always blame you guys for everything. Um, so, what would, what would you say you guys do? Yeah, so, the Justin Moore Public Design Commission Executive Director. Uh, so, Public Design Commission is essentially the design review agency for the city. Uh, we look at capital projects from a number of different city agencies. Uh, so, an agency could be a parks department, it could be transportation, uh, will develop a design proposal. Uh, that's done by architects, designers, and goes through that agency uh, review process, uh, you know, internal to the agency. Once that agency is, is uh, confident that that's a project that they can advance and, and really build, they submit to us at the Design Commission. We review projects at different stages, so it can be a very early review, uh, what we call a conceptual level of review. Uh, and give feedback so that the agency, as they're developing uh, the design and construction project, can uh, incorporate the commission. How, how much time does your review process uh, during a design, save a park, uh, how much time does your review process normally take? So we have a, a, a calendar where we review projects once a month. Uh, so the agencies have a whole uh, pipeline of multiple projects and they submit a monthly uh, and several projects typically to the Design Commission for review in that cycle. Uh, the Commission uh, meets, gives feedback, and then that uh, information goes back to the agency. In some what cases- What is the criteria for, for, for requiring a PDC approval? The city charter. No, no I'm sorry, uh, you know, if, if, if I was building a, a tot lot in a playground, does that require PDC approval? Anything that is a, a permanent installation, a permanent change to uh, the design of the city's property that is visible uh, is submitted uh, to the, the PDC review on city-owned Do, do you think that at any point that, that sometimes becomes unnecessary? Like if I'm building a tot lot yes, and the tot lot is almost identical to every other tot lot in the city of New York, is, yeah. it, is it sometimes redundant? I mean, is so we, we review several uh, tot lots, playgrounds, uh, multiple projects, and those are reviewed, the large number of them are, are reviewed and approved on one meeting cycle. There are cases where design review and design oversight is important, uh, that there uh, can be specific site conditions, a number of different... Just exp explain what, are, what an improvement would be then. If you review it and improve it, what's an improvement? Like how, how do we... So DEP lays a sewer pipe, right? That's how we measure some success. We, we built a sewer. PDC makes an improvement to a tot lot. What would that look like? An improvement? That was your, you, you said improvement. Yeah, a change, a, a change to a, a park or playground is, and we so call that an improvement. So, uh, I think she's still here. Cal Councilwoman Rose, I can't see her. Uh, she has a, a park in her district, Faber Park, and the park designers and the parks department, and I believe Councilwoman Rose, all happen to like uh, a basketball court that's on the waterfront. And like, I, I can close my eyes and I can imagine, you know, kids imagining themselves like LeBron just, in this awesome basketball court. But now I'm told that PDC wants parks to move the basketball court away from the water. Like, is that, is that like an improvement? I'm sorry, this related to m monuments? No, but I, you know, it, it, like Lord of the Flies, I have the conch, you know? I'm asking the question. Lord of the Flies. It's a good book. But it, it, I'm, just, I'm just trying to get to the bottom of, because of, PDC doesn't testify at a lot of hearings. Um, so I'm just trying to see in other words, why does PDC as an agency care if the community is happy with a basketball court on the water? Why is there an added step 
an unnecessary step. Uh, I think sometimes we, we, you know, parks has a whole bunch of problems, but sometimes they hire great landscape architects to design parks, and yet we, we add this extra step where now another group of, of, of architects, designers, folks on the commission will say, well, we don't want the park on the water. We want the, I'm sorry, the basketball court on the water. We want it, you know, uh, 50 feet inland. And now that starts a whole nother level of designs. I mean, how, is that improving? So we, uh, as was mentioned, kind of a matter of process earlier, we obviously look at uh, uh, public input as a part of our review process. And uh, projects do have uh, public hearings as a part of the PDC reviews. So uh, all of that is factored into the commission's uh, review and, and design recommendations. So uh, I, I read your annual review, and I noticed one of the projects that were, were highlighted uh, on Staten Island was historic Richmond Town. Um, have you ever been to historic Richmond Town? I personally have not been to historic Richmond Town. So I'll describe it for you in my amateur architectural knowledge. It's a collection of houses that were built roughly from 1670 uh, to the early 20th century, mostly Dutch colonial houses uh, through, say, Italianate villas. Yet when it came to the PDC to design a, um, a sort of a storage area for carriage horses, somehow we were left with a design that resembled Quonset huts, like, like Vietnam era huts that were multicolored. Every other, bear in mind, every other building on the property is a historic home. Is that improving it? I mean, this, this is in the annual review as sort of a win. Like, it's one of the projects you guys highlighted. How, how is that a better design than um, an adjacent storage facility, which is functional, but, but for example, has sort of a faux historic look? Sorry, the commission has a sort of a diverse group of people that review designs, they have different backgrounds and different sort of understandings of what makes a project or a design appropriate to its context. Um, no, no, I, I, and I get that, but, but again, we have these storage facilities that are now leaking. That's a whole separate issue with DCA. And I just want to figure out how someone, and, and why it's an improvement, to build something that is, doesn't resemble in the slightest bit a historic village and put that right in the middle of a place where people come to see a historic village. It just doesn't make sense to me, but I'll, I'll stop there. I see Barry. Can I, Barry, uh, give me the stink eye. Could so. I say something? Yes, please. I'm sorry, I'm Carrie Butler, Deputy Director of the Public Design Commission, Thank you. and I've been there for about 13 years. And we don't design pro the projects. We, we do make recommendations. I mean, I don't personally, but the commissioners who are professionals do make recommendations. And there are instances where you can have a contemporary design fit into a historical context quite successfully. Um, I think that, you know, I think Favor Park was resolved, if I'm not correct, but I'm happy to look into that for you. Um, you know, there are cases where our commissioners who have expertise in architecture and landscape architecture and civic design and transportation may question the layout of parks. And when we get feedback from, you know, there may be that we just need some more explanation and then it's resolved. So, you know, I do think that things like uh, tot locks are very quickly reviewed and we don't spend a lot of time trying to, you know, make people do revisions on projects but Then, like then do you think there's a little bit of mission creep for the agency where uh, you, you've expanded beyond, you know, sort of the, the and I don't mean to, I don't mean to sort of bring a, a platonic uh, argument of aesthetics, but w what is art, but is there a mission creep where, where this is an added step to almost every single project? I, mean, I don't believe so, but I'm happy to work with all the city agencies to try to expedite their review processes. We have worked with people on, you know, using prefab, using prototypical designs, like um, reviewing things in expedited manner. We, we, we are willing to do that. Thank you, both of you. Thank you. Thank you, Councilman Borelli. Uh, we'll now hear from Peter Koo. <clears throat> Thank you, uh, Chair. Uh, well, Dan Che um, and Jimmy Van Bremen and Rosenthal. Uh, thank you for coming to testify. Uh, I support the two new bills that will improve uh, gender and cultural diversity of, of monuments, 
uh, uh, put into the New York City parks and other areas. So I, I will give you a simple question. Yeah. Uh, in my area, uh, since it has changed a lot, right? Now we have more Asian Americans than other groups. So many groups in my community, uh, they come to me, they say, hey, council member, I want to, we want to put a statue of Confucius uh, in the area. And Confucius, as all of you know, is the most famous educator, teacher, philosopher, you know. Um, so it's, uh, um, they were proud of Confucius, you know, because of their philosophy. And, and also, the, uh, Confucius' idea is to teach everyone, no matter you how poor, or how rich, or what background you have, you have to receive a basic good education. So how do I go by it? Can you show me a road map in a like couple of minutes? Yeah. How to do it? Um, first step is go to the Public uh, Design Commission or what? Uh, if I may, uh, uh, huh? with the Parks Department, and uh, generally speaking, the process, putting percent, percent for art aside, what you're talking more about is sort of a uh, publicly initiated, uh, commissioned, if you will, uh, and often funded uh, effort to install permanent artwork on city property. And, and generally how that's handled is by the individual agency that owns that property. So if it's a, you know, if it's a DOT island, conversation would be DOT. If it's parkland, it would be with parks. So just speaking specifically for parkland, uh, we have a, our, our, our division, uh, Arts and Antiquities, which engages with uh, uh, local community members constantly. They're always available. Uh, anyone interested in the sort of process to uh, explore whether you know such a donation of a permanent art piece uh, is, is makes sense for a given location. That's something we're always open to having uh, conversations with the community. So, uh, how long will you take to accomplish the whole process? A few years, or well, it depends on a lot of factors. There's a lot of variables. Depends on what's proposed. It depends on what site is being you know identified as whether it's feasible. Sometimes uh, you know a proposal might be duplicative of another you know effort that's made elsewhere. Uh, and then uh, specific to parklands, these are private donations of artwork. So uh, there's a series of conversations, and those you know that public citizenry you know has to often sort of gather sort of funds and other sort of make sure there's consensus among you know what they believe. And so that process, that you know conversation, if you will, can take considerable time because sometimes the community you know, disagrees within itself about what they want to see represented and where and, and various details. So that can take significant time. Uh, once it coalesces into a formal proposal, you know, that process, I think, you know, can, uh, between, you know, the, the funds that need to be raised and the process to go through, you know, identifying a designer and all, all the various steps that come into place can, can take a couple of years, absolutely. So uh, if the statue is not in city parks, uh, suppose they want to do it in the uh, pedestrian plaza, so then they have to go to DOT or what? Yeah, the individual agency that has jurisdiction over that given location will, will, will be the, the sort of lead agency in, in conducting that conversation. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Councilman Ku. We will uh, now hear uh, from Majority Leader Lori Cumbo, and I want to welcome uh, Councilwoman Inez Barron of Brooklyn, and then she will make a statement about her bill uh, after Majority Leader is done. Thank you. Thank you, and thank you all for being here today. Um, just wanted to talk about the, in the statement that was read, it spoke about, uh, and I'm very pleased and very proud of the sculptures that you uh, marked of Alison Sarr's sculpture of Harriet Tubman, which I love, Gabrielle Coran's depictions of Frederick Douglass and Malcolm X. I also love the Duke Ellington sculpture. Uh, the New York Public Library sculpture honoring Langston Hughes. In an instance like that, love these sculptures and love going to Harlem to see them. What is Brooklyn doing wrong that we don't have that same uh, level of representation in our borough where we want to have um, rec rep representations of our own culture in our borough? What did we do wrong? I don't know that anything. And what did they do right? <laughs> so a lot of these um, artworks uh, came in because they're part of a capital project. And, uh, and so that's, you know, it, it, and most of those capital projects uh, were named or there's some significant um, event that happened that was, was 
very easy to make it into a monument. For example, the Audubon Ballroom, Malcolm X, Frederick Douglass Circle was named Frederick Douglass Circle before we had an artwork there. Um, so, so, so that made sense. Um, you are getting the Shirley Chisholm um, that we're working on in Brooklyn, so. Okay, the, the challenge that I have with that is like the Percent for Art program is designed around a capital project. So if you look at the Betty Saar sculpture, that seems to be in like a public plaza mm -hmm. of sorts. So was a precedent set because that was done in a public plaza that now we can utilize public plazas as opportunities to do public art? I'll give you um, an example. Um, what's currently known now as BAM Park, we're looking to uh, rename into Betty Carter Park. So when I say I would love to have a sculpture of Betty Park, I mean of Betty Carter in the, the, what's now known as the BAM Park, I get kind of that situation where everyone goes like, you gotta go to that person. So it seems like there's this thing where you can't quite nail down how you go about the process of having what happened with uh, Alison Saar's beautiful work. I want that to happen mm -hmm. in BAM Park as well. Well, actually, Alison Saar was part of a capital project as well. It was a DOT project that, um, a streetscape project that, um, that we, and so was Frederick Douglass as well. So they were both capital projects. Because we've had a lot of plaza projects happen in Brooklyn, but no sculptures. Mm -hmm. Again, what did we do wrong? And so, what did Harlem do right? Yeah, so um, most of the plaza projects, um, the percent for it doesn't really kick in unless it's a, a certain uh, threshold in terms of the budget, of the construction budget. Uh, and so a project that is above, uh, that's five million and above, uh, is automatically eligible because you know the one percent is fifty thousand dollars, and anything less than that, it doesn't. When you take out the artist's um, fee, you, you're not left with much to mm -hmm. create an impact in terms of an artwork. Um, so, and from my understanding, is a lot of the plaza projects are very small kind of um, capital projects. And but but that Betty Sutter project looks pretty small too. But again, that that section there was just part of a, a, a bigger component, I, I believe. Yeah. Let me just say this, I believe that it's important for us to create as it pertains to plazas, and many of you may know that I've been fighting for this and working towards this. We need to create a formalized process in terms of how we review our plazas because it can't be this, I don't know, a few couple of people get in a room and decide, you know what, we should probably put some resources behind this particular project versus that particular project. I'd like to see a formalized process for the opportunity for plazas to have two things. One, a name, and two, um, how that community wants to realize artwork there. Because that's a wonderful opportunity, the plazas, to be able to do that. Okay. Um, and I'm gonna stay on that one, because that one's important to me, um, in terms of my final term in office. So the Percent for Art program, Council Member Jimmy Van Bramer and I worked very hard to increase the Percent for Art uh, program. Um, I believe, and my numbers are off, we increased the budget and the ability to be able to spend from I believe 1.3 million to I believe about 4.6 million. Since that um, was changed, what percentage of that are we actually realizing? So the annual um, um, amount that we could spend per year is, is four million. That, that's, that was the change. And uh, the calculation was from, um, from calculating the percentage was uh, 1% of the, it used to be 1% of the first 20 million and uh, with your help we, we got up to 1% of the first 50 million, which increased our allocation per, for some projects per artwork. Right. right? Um, so in terms of, um, so that kicked in earlier last year, in 2018, it, 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 the, the, those projects were eligible to, to, to meet those calculations. And um, we have begin commissioning some works with the new, with the new math. And it, it does take, because our projects are tied to the, the capital project schedule, it will take um, a number of years to actually see the results in, in an actual artwork. But did a DCLA in any way, because if, if we increase the amount of public art 
resources that are able to be spent, but we didn't provide any infrastructure for it, then if it's the same staff, same review panel, same process, same people, same execution, then you'll never really be able to realize the amount of money. Um, and I'd like to know where are we in that process because I believe we passed this legislation very early in my tenure. So I'm, I'm surprised that it hasn't um, ramped up to be able to provide more public art yeah, again, it, it sort of comes in with the types of projects that we have um, that are being initiated through capital projects. Uh, so if it's not a gigantic project where it's, you know, the, uh, the calculations, you know, shown a, a big increase, then it's just an, a, a normal kind of amount. Um, we are doing quite a bit more, um, and uh, the increase in art allocation allows us to, be, to do bigger projects or have more artists per project, let's say, um, and that is happening. Uh, but again, it does take a little bit of time. Um, I have two final questions. So huh, I just feel like I, I, I want to see a lot more art before we leave, and I, I don't know how to jumpstart this process in order to make it happen. I thought that changing the budget and the amount of money would spearhead um, that process moving forward. So. It, and this might have been discussed, and I'm sure it was, with Council Member Garencheck, because this is um, his hearing, but if we have a park in our area, there's so many wonderful parks in our area, like Jackie Robinson Park, like what's going to be Betty Carter Park, all of these different parks that are just so phenomenal in our district but have no artistic markers, what's going to be the process moving forward so that these particular spaces can have permanent works of art that many of our other parks already have. If it's a capital project, um, then the percent for art kicks in and we could commission a work of art. It kicks in. Okay, here's the, here's the magic nugget in all of this. There are thousands of capital projects that are happening all across the city, thousands. How do you all pick? What is the process for which projects get pulled out? and say this project will get uh, public art funding through the Percent for Art program, like our libraries. We love Grand Army Plaza Library. That beautiful gold um, a sculpture outside that em embellishes the doors, it's iconic. But there have also been many libraries that have received capital dollars that don't have any public art. How do you select? Because that process has to be unmystified. Mm -hmm. So um, we work with our design agencies, Department of Design and Construction, EDC, uh, SCA, to w when they do have capital projects, the first thing that we do is to see what is the amount of um, the construction budget and see, again, like I mentioned before, if it's uh, below five million, then the percentage is very low to make an impact of an artwork. Uh, and second, we have a, a discussion as to what if it's a, what is the most public facing component of that capital project, uh, where, where is it in, um, and, and then we, we, we go through the process of, of commissioning an artwork. We can't, um, for certain projects, um, we always do, we always try to do percent for art, whether it be a school, a library, um, police station, that sort of things that is very community oriented or became, uh, uh, projects that are community hubs, we, we always try to do percent for art in them, and we're doing quite a few libraries in Brooklyn and in, in, in Queens and, and throughout. Um, we I feel like I'm missing out. I, I, could, I could give you a list of the ones that we have. But again, if, if the agency does not um, put that project forward, sometimes you know, we're, we're not able to see them, but we always, um, as much as possible, I feel like we have those. to demystify that because we have everything from waste transfer stations to libraries to parks to major construction that's happening all throughout the city. And for us to only, to be celebrating at this point one Shirley Chisholm sculpture in the whole borough of Brooklyn means that something is way off in terms of what's actually happening with those dollars to do those forms of public art. The last one that I will say, because I'm sure this is not happening, but this is a concept that I want to put out, I believe that the MIH program that we have as far as housing should also kick in with some form of 
uh, percent for art because what's happening is that there's so much construction and architecture that's being built in Brooklyn, New York that is uniconic, unimaginative, boring, just nothing happening about it. These buildings that are being built in Brooklyn will never be in any kind of architectural design book of the 100 greatest anythings, right? So we need to create a way for the, for, for the arts community to work with these architects in order to create a design and a building and art that is reflective of the borough that people are gonna be proud of, that's gonna incorporate our history and our culture, that people are gonna wanna come to see, like how everybody goes to Spain to see Gaudi, they wanna see the beautiful architecture and the design, something different and imaginative. Nobody's gonna be coming to Brooklyn to see anything that we've built as far as our design and architecture. So I just wanna put that concept out there. If, if a project qualifies for MIH, we should have an ability to kick in a percent for art in order to create some level of interest in the design that's happening. And that, those are my final comments. Thank you. Thank you, Majority Leader Cumbo. I want to welcome our guests. I don't know where you're from, but welcome to the New York City Council. At uh, this time, uh, we will hear from Councilwoman Inez Barron of Brooklyn with a statement on her legislation. Uh, thank you to the chairs for holding this hearing. And thank you to the panel for coming. I hear I missed the commissioner, but um, I heard. But this is an important topic, and it deserves our time and attention. And all of those who have some impact on the decisions that are going to be made should be involved in the hearing. So I'm disappointed that the commissioner could not remain. I wanted to talk briefly about my bill, and then I do have some questions for the panel. The bill that's proposed is one that would establish a task force. Now we know because of the pressure that had been put on the mayor uh, for the community, particularly in East Harlem, and led by uh, protests uh, by persons, activists such as Viola Plummer for over 10 years, the Sims statue was removed. We know the horrific experiments he conducted without using anesthesia on black women that he purchased, particularly for that reason. And we know that when he perfected his experiments and used those techniques on white women, he did use anesthesia. So the blatant racism that we see uh, in his life and in his work under the guise of a doctor uh, was certainly more than cause to have the statue removed and the pedestal should have gone with the man. So that did not happen then. It's still a battle that we're waging, and we do want to see that pedestal removed as well. We can't do half of the job. We've got to do all of it. We've got, he's got to be obliterated in terms of getting recognition for work that he has, experiments that he had conducted on women that were enslaved. So, Following the mayor's commission, uh, there was still much work to be done. So what the bill proposes is that we establish a task force and that this task force be charged with examining what other historical monuments and markers need to be confronted and addressed and how we can make sure that we have a reflection of monuments highlighting people and events that talk about the humanity and talk about the goals that we say we as a nation hold great and hold in high esteem. Um, I won't ask you to look behind you at that statue behind you. In my opinion, it needs to go and I'm working on that to, as well. It's not something that I understand your, your commission has authority over, but I don't think we need to elevate and bring um, any kind of accolades to people who enslaved Africans, who raped teenage children, and who uh, did not have any worthwhile contribution to ending the horrific conditions of slavery in America. So that's what the task force seeks to do. And I do have some questions. The task force 
wants to, as we say, talk about broader issues and highlight great people that uh, recommend, that represent the great goals that we have set before us. Here in this building, we are benefiting from the work of enslaved Africans, particularly here and particularly on Wall Street. It was a big battle to get a marker on Wall Street talking about the fact that the market that was engaged in was the exchange of Africans that had been kidnapped, that had been humanly trafficked and brought here. It was a big battle to get that. My question is, how are we going to ensure that as markers are added to locations that we feel are significant to our history, they acknowledge and include the work that was done by the Africans that were enslaved and brought here. There should be a marker on the gates of City Hall talking about the work that had been done to build this establishment that was done by uncompensated labor of Africans. Everything in, that helped to build this country should include that proviso, that acknowledgement that this was the work that was done by uncompensated labor from Africans who never received reparations and people get nervous and talk about it being divisive to talk about the fact that we are entitled to have some kind of compensation. But how are we going to look at making sure that that happens? The contributions of enslaved Africans that built particularly this city. A lot of people did not even know that New York City had enslaved Africans, but it did. But how are we going to make sure that as we put up historical markers and monuments, the whole area of Red Hook and Fort Greene were, were uh, populated and, and embellished and improved because of the work of Africans that were enslaved. So how are we gonna make sure that when these markers go up, there's some significance to that? There was a marker at the New York, uh, at the Brooklyn New Lots Public Library that talked about the fact that the library itself was built on what had been an African burial ground. That marker's gone, nobody can trace it and nobody can tell me yet where it is. But how are we going to make sure that those kinds of acknowledgments are included and preserve them. And if you can find that marker, which was in the lobby of the library until about maybe 15 years ago, that would be great. That was a long introduction to a short <laughs> question. Um, well, I can speak specifically to Metro from Parks. Uh, I can speak specifically to historical signage that exists you know, on Parkland. And we, we, are, we, we are very mindful and we're at, very happy to work with uh, you know, historical advocates and things of that nature when we are providing uh, historical signage. And, you know, for example, the slave market marker downtown, you know, uh, right not too far from here was a really important, you know, you know, obviously uh, overly, overdue, clearly. Uh, and Overdue and a fight to get it. Yeah, I, I can't, I, I won't, I wouldn't claim credit or I was not part of that process. I came in, frankly, uh, it happened shortly after I arrived at the agency, so I can't, okay. but I, I, I fully believe that, I'm sure. And we thank the advocates and the elected officials who joined in that advocacy. Uh, similarly, I think there are other uh, properties on, that are parkland that have these sort of historic natures, and we do everything in our power to sort of reflect that history when, whenever possible. Obviously, there are other locations, historic buildings, you know, kind of depends what entity has oversight. You know, in, in terms of how that's signed, but generally speaking, I know this administration is committed to making sure that our that our history is properly reflected. So, is there a person who has that task to make sure that you do that research in the, in the historical documents to we, be able to include that? Yes, we have a we have a a, a team of historians and, and experts who work closely. There are our Arts and Antiquities Division. Uh, each of our historical signs that are posted are actually also available online as well, not just in person, but we also wanted it to be a resource that's available to the, to the broader public, just interested in the history of New York City, so that the language can be mirrored, you know, available to other people as well. Uh, and so, yes, that's, it's something that's very much on our minds. Okay. Anybody else? I think we're the, I'm the only representative of jurisdictional agency okay. here, so. Okay, now in terms of the 1% uh, for art, uh, I'm very pleased to say that there's a new high school being built in my community. The school is being valued at $111 million. How are we going to involve the students that will be in that school, it's a high school, to have, and the principal and the staff and the community to have 
a decision-making voice in the art that goes into that school. Mm -hmm. It's just now, the ground is just being broken, so we're at the beginning stages of that. How are we going to make sure that what they want in the building where they will be students attending daily is what they want? Mm -hmm. Um, so the good thing about when we commission artwork for existing schools where there is a, an addition or, or some major innovation. You said existing schools? Is it not an existing school? Not yet. It's, okay. it's, it, was, it was demolished and is now a new school that's being built. A brand new school is being built. But it, had, it has existing student body or, and principal? Yes. Oh, yeah. So, yeah. Okay. So, so the good thing about that is that um, throughout our process, th these are the people we engage through um, even before we start having a, a conversation about art. Um, and so when we do go through our process of selecting an artist, they are actually sitting on the panel and uh, part of selecting artists to do the work. When the artist is selected, um, part of the artist's um, task is to have conversations with that student body and the principal to determine um, how much, uh, to, to determine what the artwork actually is. So it, it's, it's, a, it, it's a very engaging process. In the length of time that it's going to take the Builder School, which is projected to be three years, where in that timeline does this process start? It happens in the beginning during the design. I don't think it's happened. I think, well, we may not be at that phase of the design, but I'll be in touch with you because um, I've asked about it and I've been told, well, when we get to that stage, we'll make sure that that happens. Mm -hmm. But I'm very concerned about that. And as well as, um, talking about the fact that uh, the monument, going back to Sims, the pedestal was a part of the monument. It wasn't always there. It had been located someplace else previously. So the fact that that pedestal remains is still a, uh, an insult, and uh, it's only half of the job, and I think we need to look at making sure that it's done not to say, well, we'll put something else there to give the other perspective or the other side, but to make sure that that happens. Um, so that basically was most of the questions that I had. And I thank you for your listening and for your responses. I did have another question. Where do we have the exact count of the number of statues that represent blacks and the number of monuments that represent blacks, a number of historical markers that have reference to blacks or African Americans. Do you have that exact number? Uh, so uh, the Parks Department does have a complete inventory, but that's not the city's complete inventory, obviously. So one of the outcomes of the mayor's uh, commission was uh, providing some funding uh, that has come uh, through cultural affairs to the PDC uh, to do a, a complete inventory of the uh, monuments. Uh, so that work is, is underway. We've, we've got a good start, but we expect to have that uh, sometime in the summer, uh, the complete inventory of the monuments. The markers is a much larger project uh, the, that you know, we honestly don't have the resources to, to do the full inventory of every uh, marker. Um, do we know how many markers there are? A lot. <laughs> so <laughs> if, if we know how many there are, can't we find out what they say? So, so that's what, it, t it takes a lot of time and research, so we can, but that's not something that we anticipate that we'll be able to do uh, in our first round of research. But we're absolutely committed to uh, doing that. That might be a nice work. project for summer youth to work on. We talk about how we can use our youth and get them engaged and involved. It might be a way to engage them for the summer youth. And lastly, uh, Mr. Chair, thank you. The, the grand entrance to the Brooklyn Public Library that my colleague referred to has many uh, indications and inclusions of African history in it and African um, uh, markers, but I don't know that they are in any way acknowledged. So perhaps we can look at that and make sure that we include information that highlights what are the African icons and markers that are a part of that beautiful doorway? Thank you. Thank you, Councilwoman Barron. Um, I just want to ask, and I think somebody covered it. Um, 
Matt, is there a policy at Parks and Recreation for siting statues? I mean, we have 30,000 acres of parkland, and statues generally take up, you know, a few dozen square feet. But I, I you know, <laughs> I know some places are more desirable, obviously. But I just wondered, uh, is there something on paper that, that talks about how you actually look at a site? Uh, so we have a, uh, a set of uh, guidelines for, for dona donating permanent artwork uh, to, on park lands, which kind of spells out a, a pretty robust process uh, to engage. And obviously, parks is as as primary stakeholder, you know, with jurisdiction. You know, obviously, have a lot to say about endorsing ideas and, and shaping them along. But that also involves, uh, you know, working closely with those uh, interested parties. Um, I will say, you know, Ket, uh, generally speaking, we've also tried to be very aggressive about pursuing opportunities for temporary art, sometimes upwards of a year. And you know, obviously, you know, permanence has its place, and that's we entertain proposals of that sort. Um, all the time, but also I didn't want to. I think it's very important to highlight there. Are, there's a variety of efforts underway. Our art in the parks program is is robust, uh, and is very much a focus uh, as making sure that you know parks can stay in, you know engaging and and uh, dynamic. And so I don't. I wanted to give that. I understand it's not the uh, t topic of today's hearing, but it's a really important part of our portfolio in terms of making sure that people visiting our art in our public spaces, you know, kind of get an engaging and, and uh, dynamic experience. All right. Um, can you, I know we have the antiquities uh, division. Uh, do you have an idea what their budget is a year and what they, um, I, you know, I know some of it is done by conservancies now, um, such as the statues in Central Park and other parks with their conservancies. Um, but I know that it's a far, I mean, it's, it's I've seen statues all over the city now. Um, I'm just wondering what the budget is for that. So I don't have those budgetary in information on hand. I will say that it's a, a moderately small team that, that works extremely hard uh, taking care of existing works and also uh, exp you know, running, also running the temporary our temporary art program. And they work uh, tirelessly. I have to give credit to our director, Jonathan Kuhn, uh, and his team. Uh, we do have some uh, conservators and other things of that nature on staff. But it's uh, one of the reasons why most of the statuary uh, that has been commissioned over the years was essentially sort of crowdfunded, if you will, and a lot of that often includes a maintenance endowment that's been, you know, that, that's been raised that helps provide for that care. But also the agency has been quite creative about getting out there and finding grants, identifying additional opportunities. You know, the, the, you know this administration, you know, gives the agency the resources it needs, but we don't stop there. We, we obviously, you know, look for every opportunity to make sure that we're taking care of, of this portfolio. And you mentioned temporary art, and I love the gates. I mean, I'm dating myself a little, but it was Spectacular, um, beyond spectacular. Can you talk about if I had a work of art that I wanted to, you probably wouldn't allow it, but um, <laughs> my spin art was quite wonderful, I have to. Uh, can you talk about that process a little? Yeah, absolutely. We have a very robust, uh, and it's all publicly available on our website, you know, our, our Art in the Parks program. We take submissions from artists all the time. Uh, in fact, we're, we, we've really put a lot of work into diversifying uh, the sites and locations at which this art is being displayed. Uh, and we're, we're quite proud of that. Uh, quite recently, our, I think we, uh, we've worked in close uh, partnership with Uniqlo. They funded a, a grant program, and we funded, I think, through that, 10 locations uh, throughout the city. Very exciting, uh, you know, fresh, uh, artistically interesting, you know, from different voices. Uh, and, and so we, you know, we appreciate you know, opportunities like that, and we look for every, every chance. So if you're an artist and you're interested, by all means, please visit you know, our uh, Parks Department website and, and uh, seek more information. All right, I think uh, Chair Van Bramer has a question. One, one last thing. First of all, I just want to say, because uh, 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 Councilmember Borelli rightly asked uh, some questions of uh, Justin. I, I do want to say, Justin, since you've joined uh, in your position as director of the Public Design Commission, we have had a hearing, uh, and you have been the most accessible um, uh, director that I know of in, in the uh, commission. So I just want to um, say that. Um, and I want to say to Matt, so, you know, I think Council Member Barron raises a lot of really, really important points, and I think we're never really going to get to where we need to be unless we actually proactively look for opportunities to uh, change names uh, or, or gain opportunities to rename things uh, to actually bring the equity that we're looking for, right? It's not just about... Uh, creating new statues or new plaques or new things. Uh, but, uh, for example, I have an opportunity in my district, right? We've also got a lot of parks that have these 
really goofy names, right, that maybe Henry Stein named like 35 years ago, right? And one of mine is Bridge and Tunnel Park, right? As a kid <laughs> who grew up in Queens, I've always resented the Bridge and Tunnel crowd thing, you know what I mean? And, and that's the name of a park as you enter Queens, Bridge and Tunnel Park. So as you may or may not know, Matt, I've actually raised the idea of like, why don't we rename that in honor of a woman who uh, has great distinction in Queens or the city of New York, right? That's the kind of thing that we need to be doing more. So uh, not just waiting, right? Like waiting, waiting, waiting. Like why don't we actually go out there and look, survey, you know, and say, oh, this is a dopey name of a park that someone thought was cute 35 years ago or 50 years ago, 100 years ago. And you're like, no, that has no more relevance, right? We want to actually take this as an opportunity. We have a list. There's so many women. There's so many people of color. There's so many African Americans. Like, let's do that, right? And let's do that quickly. So I don't know what the process is, but I have already raised Bridge and Tunnel Park in Long Island City, and like, let's do it. Uh, so a couple things. Uh, one, uh, I, am, I, I hail originally from New Jersey, so I'm equally offended by the name, I suppose. It's <laughs> like sort of two sides of that coin, I guess. Uh, but I can, I, I'm happy to say that, at A, we, we, view, we agree, we, have, we view uh, Bridge and Tunnel as a, as a really exciting, opera. It's, it's a rather generic name, uh, if not insulting. So, uh, so I think we'd, we'd really, I think we would like to actively work with, with your office and other stakeholders, you know, to kind of figure out, you know, what name makes more sense. And I'll go further and say that, you know, Commissioner Silver has thought a lot about identifying potential opportunities like this. Uh, I will note, however, in doing that, because there are sometimes names, uh, there are duplicates, for example, you know, there's more than one, you know, blank park, you know, that does sometimes happen. However, local constituencies may have attachments to that name, even some that sound, you know, Playground 134 doesn't sound like it, but, you know, it, folks who grew up in that neighborhood. So I just would only add that as a caveat that I think we are actively looking for opportunities of that nature because, you know, obviously monuments are not far from the only way to capture New York's history and the, and the, the amount of people that should. Uh, you know, but I'll just caveat that, A, you can, you know, obviously people have differing opinions, and that can be a very, you know, challenging conversation. Uh, and, and more to the point, there will always be more people who deserve renaming than there are opportunities, you know, in terms of, you know, whether that's, you know, uh, people who are of service, you know, to the city, or people who gave their lives in service for the city, like, there'll always be more of that, you know, those are, that doesn't mean we, you know, we shouldn't be proactive about finding that, so we're happy to work with you about continuing that, those efforts. Great. That's Thank you. Me. I don't have a bridge and tunnel park, but I do have a holy cow playground. <laughs> named after the great Yankee shortstop Phil Rizzuto, although he now has a park named after him in Richmond Hill where he grew up. My counsel, the great Yankee fan, Steve Bihar, might object, but as a Met fan, I <laughs> find it a bit much. Uh, at this time, I'm gonna dismiss this panel. I wanna thank you for being here uh, today, for being with us for nearly two hours. And I am going to call, we have two panels, and uh, the first panel uh, uh, from the Municipal Arts Society, Tara Kelly from New Yorkers for Parks, Lynn Kelly uh, from the Girl Scouts of Greater New York, Meredith Mascara, and representing herself, Professor Harriet Senny. I hope I got that right. Did I get that right? Senny? Rhymes with Penny. Okay, thank you. The next panel after this will be uh, uh, Amina Ali. Uh, Judeline Cassidy, I hope I pronounced that right, uh, Pam Elam, or Elam, and Brenda Berkman. So um, uh, I will we'll set the clock for uh, three minutes, if you would, and uh, Miss Kelly, whoever, Ms., whichever Miss Kelly <laughs> wants to start first. No relation, but we work together quite a bit. No relation, I'm shocked, no. okay. Yes. Uh, thank you to the council for inviting us to speak today. My staff has prepared wonderful testimony, but as usually, I'm gonna go off the record, but I'm on shocked, the record Lynn. and I'm speak shocked. from my heart. Imagine okay. that. <laughs> if you'll humor me for a minute, I just wanna read you a list, and I'm gonna ask you at the end of this list, what do all these organizations have in common, okay? Prospect Park, Central Park, Hudson River Park, Randall's Island Park, Snug Harbor Cultural Center, Madison Square Park, Battery Park, Flushing Meadows Park, Van Cortland Park, Forest Park, Union Square Park, Fort Tryon Park, Historic Harlem Parks, Bronx River Parks Alliance, Gowanus Canal Conservancy, 
uh, Alley Pond Park, Downtown Alliance, Brooklyn Greenway Initiative, New Yorkers for Parks, New York Restoration Project, Design Can Trust for Public you. Space, Municipal Arts Society, Horticultural Society, The Nature Conservancy, Autobahn NYC, City Parks Foundation, The Landmarks Conservancy, The Natural Areas Conservancy, and the League of Conservation Voters. Exactly, nope, wait, one better. One thing that ties the thread in 30 of the largest organizations that care for parks and the public realm in New York, they are all run by women. Every single one. Yes, I that have, gets a hands up. I, I just for the record want to state that I may be the only man in America who has worked for four women elected officials, four different ones. So. Amen. Can I say that in city council? You could say that yes. in city council. <laughs> and I say this to say that as a city that aims to be equitable to all its residents, in a city where all of the largest organizations that care for the public realm, care for parks, care for quality of life for all New Yorkers, we can do better when it comes to representation in our parks for statues and for monuments. We have to do better when more than 50% of the users arguably are women. So I'm here today to both thank the council for bringing this to the attention of the administration. We commend the administration's work so far on what they're trying to do, but more has to be done. And I stand united with my fellow female leaders of all these organizations to say that we have to do better in getting representation in our parks. And I want to thank you for your time this morning. Thank you, Lynn. And I want to thank you for working with me. Um, to indulge myself here, the, uh, on, on Thursday, we will be kicking off the Play Fair um, campaign for parks, which seeks to uh, raise a, an additional $100 million in expense funding for parks, so I uh, hope that uh, some of you who are listening can be with us Thursday at high noon. This is just the beginning of a uh, what will be a multi-year campaign um, to raise additional funding for parks, and I thank you for working with me on that, and thank you for your comments today. Thank you, Councilman. Ms. Kelly. Hi, thank you. Uh, good, good morning, almost afternoon. I'm Tara Kelly, representing the Municipal Art Society of New York. Uh, we have been one of the watchful guardians over New York City's architecture and public art since 1893. Following its founding premise of commissioning and endorsing public art, MAS, in 1987, in partnership with the Public Design Commission and the Parks Department, launched the Adopt a Monument program to restore 20 of the most threatened statues in the five boroughs damaged by pollution, neglect, and vandalism. The MAS sought corporations, foundations, and private funders to underwrite the cost of each conservation. Success led to the second partnership with the city, the Adopt a Mural program initiated in 1991. To date, 52 works of public art have been rescued, restored, and importantly maintained. The artworks are far ranging in location, style, and material, representing an investment of $4 million to the city. Included among these is the magnificent Beaux-Arts ceiling mural in this very chamber room, New York receiving the tributes of the nations, as well as iconic sculptures in your neighborhoods. Some of these are Lincoln and Lafayette monuments in Prospect Park, Rocket Thrower in Flushing Meadows, Heinrich Heine in Joyce Kilmer Park in the Bronx, and the Neptune Fountain in Snug Harbor, Staten Island. Thus, MAS greatly appreciates the attention of city council to this very important matter of today's hearing, especially relevant in recent years. The city's track record for commem commemorating people of color and women has improved greatly since 1945 when only two non-white male representations existed in, in figurative statuary. Today, of the 118 sculptures of individuals, 23 represent people of color or women. While progress has been made, indeed, the city has not gone far enough. And so we are here to support you in that effort. We ask the new task force take note that figurative public art has been on the wane in the 21st century and therefore urge the task force to think beyond bronze and stone in telling our city's untold stories. We also believe that the charge of this task force should be as broad as possible in order to seize the incredible momentum towards equity. Every art form should be plumbed for its inherent ability to reflect the city and its rich narratives. Beyond formal art, park names, street signs, temporary installations, and celebrations are all ways of amplifying this history. On a more specific note, we respectfully ask that the chair of the Landmarks Preservation Commission, rather than the executive director, and the chair of the Public Design Commission both be appointed to the proposed task force. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Uh, Ms. Mascara. Thank you, 
Uh, good morning, good afternoon, uh, and thank you for the committee for be letting me be here. I'm Meredith Mascara, the CEO of the Girl Scouts of Greater New York. I'm not only here testifying on behalf of myself, my five daughters, but most importantly on behalf of the 31,000 Girl Scouts here in New York City. Uh, I was actually a little disappointed that I couldn't bring a girl with me today to testify, but it is the first day back from public, for public schools from vacation uh, until I started hearing uh, the PDC talking earlier. And I would not want my girls to hear that this has been deprioritized and put off and put off for way too long. And we just need, we need to stop. We need to, to do something about it now and reprioritize the work of the, of the commission. Uh, and after listening to them, the need for oversight, these laws and transparency is so clear. And if the PDC is not willing to prioritize this, the city council needs to. It's insulting. It's insulting to all of us. Uh, I have girls who have been organizing since 2016, working with the statue fund, who have made more progress than, than the commission here has. Uh, they raised money through their cookie sales. They have advocated and rallied and worked to get a statue uh, of the suffragettes put up in Central Park and it is put on pause. Okay. And I have to answer to those girls, and I have to tell them that all of the work that they have done is put on pause and may not happen until after they graduate. And I'm telling you right now, these girls need answers now, and you need to, you need to make sure that the commission is, and this administration is accountable to making sure this work is done and that there is fair and equitable representation of women and tell the right history and story of New York City. Even walking into this building, when I bring Girl Scouts here, I have to explain to them that this is not actually what represents New York City. This is not what represents what women have contributed to the greatness of New York City, and to tell them that they do have a place here. And it's wonderful for them to be able to see the women who actually are working here now, even though we need more of you, but they need to see it in every shape and form across this city. Uh, so please, Please be accountable for that. Let our girls have representation uh, and just make sure that this happens sooner than keep getting put off. We're tired of waiting. Thank you. We share your frustration on many levels. Um, and I thank you for being here today. It's always good to see a resident of Queens testifying. <laughs> and yeah, I know Lynn is not from Queens. That's okay. It's a big city. Uh, we've been joined at this time Island also. In the house. <laughs> Uh, by Councilman Ben Kalos of Manhattan, and we will now hear testimony from Professor Senny. Can you turn that? Does that do it? Yeah. That does it. I don't usually need it in a classroom. Um, I'm an art historian by training. I work at City College. I direct a master's program in art history and art museum studies. I've written extensively on public art, um, especially on memorials, but also on controversy. I was a member of the Mayor's Advisory Commission on City Art Monuments and Markers. I can address our thinking about the Sims base later, if you like. Um, I was also a member of the She Built New York Advisory Commission. Um, we did su uh, suggest alternative forms that some of these memorials might take. That is, the idea that we could honor groups of women, for example, women in politics that would span history, as well as uh, significant individuals. I was happily a member of the selection committee for the Susan B. Anthony Elizabeth Cady Stanton Memorial, scheduled to be in Central Park, which will put two actual women there. Um, also on the selection committee for Flight 587 in Rockaway Park, remember that one? And a little further afield to the memorial to the 1968 student uprisings in Mexico City. My comments today are based on caveats of process and they're based on my experience of serving on these uh, various public bodies. Um, I'm leery of a quota system in any arena, although I'm an ardent, ardent fan, supporter, feminist, et cetera, of more representation of women. My concern is how this quota would be implemented. Would commissions have to alternate by gender? Or would there be a catch-up period at the end of the year to balance the numbers? Either way, communities might be denied the ability to celebrate worthy individuals, even, dare I say it, white men. And might it also lead to a selection of women who are perhaps somewhat questionable choices in order to fill the quota. 
I'm sure there are other problematic issues, but these are the ones that immediately jump to mind. Um, my concern with the task force, again, something I heartily, heartily support, is that it might not adequately consider either the past or the future. Um, based on spending more time with controversies than probably any healthy person should, my conclusion is that they're largely um, and I think the words were sustained by negative attention, that these would get the most um, attention. Controversy is by its nature political. It's not always easy to ascertain what the actual agenda is and how much local support for a protest there actually is. So it's been my experience that sustained negative attention may not indeed be representative of overall community response. And I think any investigation and analysis of such a protest would be critical. Sometimes it's spearheaded by somebody with that passion. There was more, but that's all right. That's it. That's okay. Um, I think uh, Chair Rosenthal has a question for the panel. Um, and and perhaps it'll be answered more quickly than I expected, but. Uh, except for being on the committee, uh, do you have recommendations for, um, or did all of you hear about the call for um, statues depicting women? The administration said they got the word out to everyone and everyone submitted. I'm just wondering if your organization knew about it. I can speak for, for the Girl Scouts. We first uh, heard about it, honestly, from our girls who joined working with the Statue Fund uh, over three years ago. And you know that, that was a choice that they, that they did as a, as a community project to make sure that there but was fair representation. But that's this particular Statue Fund. Correct. I mean the administration. And then we were invited uh, in to, uh, because of the shared sentiment for She Built NYC. Um, with much uh, enthusiasm, uh, only to not hear anything after the initial announcement about our further participation in that. Okay, anyone else? Then? I wanna take one step back, Councilwoman. So I actually started my career at what was called the Art Commission at the time, which is now the Public Design Commission. I was in this deputy director spot many moons ago. And so what I can speak from personal experience and then kind of translate to that question today is I think several members of the council, um, particularly Council Member Kumbo, brought up this issue of process, right? Like how to get back, let's put aside the question of the, the task force right now, but look at more of the overall process. It's almost um, unfair to pin down on cultural affairs and to the design commission about where things may or may not have been bungled in the current process. What it really takes is a decision from the top about how expense dollars on construction projects will be allocated and spent. And so those organizations are, you know, doing their jobs and carrying out direction. And when I was in that role, it was only how projects were delineated, you know, whether they were prioritized or not to have public art in them. That's why it's not always, that's why there's not necessarily, uh, just because the number is X amount that it's going to get this amount, Y amount public art as from percent for art. And the other piece of it is, to really have a robust public art program like other cities do internationally and even uh, you know uh, East Coast cities, you have to be willing as a city to invest the expense dollars in the agencies that carry out those public projects. When you have one or two people running percent for art and you have hundreds and hundreds of major capital construction projects citywide, there's an inequity there from the beginning. So. You know, I commend my colleagues for the work that they do. I mean, I can, I want to say Jonathan Krauchek is here, has spent his career, as long as I've known him, caring for our sculptures in New York City, would voluntarily send his crews to Snug Harbor when I was running it to clean our Neptune fountain that was mentioned. This is like, you know, yeoman's work. Um, but in order, and this gets back to our, our campaign council member, in order to really care for our city's parks and monuments and do right by parks, we have to play fair with the budget for parks. And we have to play fair with the process. 
and we're not right now, and we can do better. Thank you. Thank yeah. you. Thank you. Uh, thank you all. Uh, Chair Van Bramer. So I, I uh, thank you, uh, and uh, Lynn, you know we're big fans from uh, your various uh, positions, and, and I appreciate what you said, which is also further uh, from our perspective why we're disappointed uh, what happened earlier, because uh, the, we could have asked about the budget for the Department of Cultural Affairs and the budget for the Percent for Art okay. program, not the budget that Lori and I fought to increase, but actually the expense and administrative budget to actually make it go faster and make it be better, mm -hmm. um, uh, which uh, you know is, is tough. And, and as I said publicly, Kendall uh, is an incredibly uh, smart and, and good person who does great work. Um, and uh, Meredith, I, I, as you were talking, I had an idea about something we might be able to do jointly with the girls to um, publicly make this process go faster. And as you have so done so amazingly, both locally and then citywide with, with uh, uh, empowering girls and, and making activists and agitators and, and future leaders, um, there may be things that we can do together that, that publicly um, make this go faster. And, and uh, it, it's not, uh, in, it's not the job necessarily of eight-year-old girls to make the city of New York do what it should, but few things can motivate the city of New York better than some really empowered eight, nine, and 10-year-old girls to do the right thing. So um, look forward to talking with you more about that. Thank you. Uh, I want to thank the panel. I also uh, would like to ask Professor Senny if you could send us a copy, if you have, of your testimony. I'd be happy to So do we that. could have that for the record. And at this time, I'm going to dismiss this panel. And thank, <laughs> thank you for you. your insight. It was, oh, I'm sorry, uh, Majority Leader. Thank you. Just wanted to add, uh, as well, my support for the Girl Scouts. It's just an incredible organization. And to see our young girls fighting so hard for their future to see representations is certainly admirable. I just wanted to touch on the, the, both the concepts that you brought up in terms of when you have an opportunity to travel nationally as well as internationally, you really see, ironically, how far behind New York City is within the public art realm. Mm -hmm. And when we have opportunities to see projects like the Gates or the Cow Parade or all of these different elements that really create fanfare in New York City, it's still amazing that we don't invest the way that we should in public art because of what it does for our cities. But I did want to address the, the, the comment around the quota, particularly because you're on the commission. I totally don't see this quota as a quota. I really see it as an opportunity to level the playing field and really an opportunity for us to put a particular focus on writing and historic wrong. And I think that the challenge of, and I'm just going to speak stereotypically, everyone forgive me, the challenge of being a woman is that we have the opportunity to see full circle and we have this deep desire often to be inclusive mm -hmm. and to think about how can we all play fair in the sandbox? How can we make sure that everybody has an opportunity? And I think that um, there are many great white men, but I believe that it's important for us now in order to create a level playing field and then to uh, have an opportunity at a later time to reintroduce great white men into the dialogue and the conversation. But I think, I think it's fair and equitable to say they've had their time, they've had a great run, and um, when we look at a dynamic like last night at the Oscars, what an incredible historic, her historic evening where we really saw that talent and creativity is the gift 
that God gives all races and all cultures. And to be able to see that last night where you would, you would go to watch the Oscars. I had stopped watching the Oscars because I had just seen, well, we're not going to win, and we're just going to go back home and be disappointed. So I think it, it was an, that those types of changes in our dynamic are so important for people to see. It's important for people to see representations of themselves, and it really just makes our culture and our society a much better, richer, fairer, more equitable, less violent place when everybody sees themselves there. I couldn't agree with you more, and I appreciate your comments. The point I w that I was trying to make was really a, a one related to process, to make sure that this is done in a way that doesn't end up with results that don't address those issues. And my comment about white men had more to do with let's stay inclusive. Let's not by definition exclude anybody, even if they've had the entire pie almost up till now. Because then we've got a historical vacuum for the period of time in which we're leveling the playing field, and I'm on that team 100%. We can agree to disagree on that one. Totally. Um, I just feel that uh, in your particular role, it's, it's, and here's the other thing about it. This process that DCLA is talking about is like a faucet that's dripping so slowly. I think it's that staffing Drip. issue that really- It's a real Drip. one. It so, really I mean, if it's, if it's a matter of like a, f a few drips, or drip every two or three years, which is unfathomable. I mean, when we look at the amount of public art that's in the city of New York, at one time, I don't know, dozens, hundreds of sculptures had to be built or created in one or two years. City beautiful movement. Right? So this is really an opportunity for us to fast forward this process and to really hone in on some great and dynamic people. And it's okay to agree to disagree. I, absolutely. Um, I, I'm so thrilled with the support for public art. I just want to say when I first started researching this area and I looked it up in the card catalog, I got the art of public speaking. No joke. Thank you all um, for your testimony today. It was most insightful. I do want to say one of the most teachable moments in my life. Um, I was with my mother-in-law who is a young woman from Brooklyn, although she now lives in Queens, and uh, I was with her the day that Ruth Bader Ginsburg was nominated for the Supreme Court. Mm. And she pretty much did what Professor Senny did, she cried. She literally cried, and I understood it because it was her going to the Supreme Court. And um, I know for the first time now we have an Attorney General who's a woman of color, and she has taken the hopes and dreams of millions of women of color in this state and around the nation um, I look forward to the day when, when um, something like that is not news. We've got work to do, obviously, and I want to thank you all for being here today. And I'm going to dismiss you now with a wave of my hand and uh, welcome the next panel. Ms. Cassidy, Ms. Elam, Ms. Berkman, and Ms. Ali. Uh, Ms. Cassidy, if you'd like to begin. No. Oh, okay. You're going to tell me what you're going to do. Okay. <laughs> Sorry, I yeah. take instruction. My wife won't believe this, but I do take instruction well at times. Well, actually, the three of us are from the same organization. Okay. We're going to divide our testimony in thirds to meet your time schedule. You so can have. We literally will go in this direction. Okay. Take your time. <clears throat> Thank you very much. Thanks for the opportunity to testify on proposals to make the city's process for creating monuments more transparent and fair. We approach those issues from a unique vantage point. I'm Pam Elam, president of the Stanton and Anthony Statue Fund, 
and our Monumental Women campaign. Board members Brenda Berkman and Judeline Cassidy and I are here today to offer a brief overview of our five-year experience as an all-volunteer tax-exempt charity dealing with the city to break the bronze ceiling in Central Park to create the first statue of real women in the park's 165-year history. Monumental Women, our campaign, is a three-part project to increase the awareness and appreciation of the vast and varied contributions women have made to history, as well as to challenge municipalities across the country to reimagine their public spaces to honor more women and people of color. Little did we know that we would have to challenge our own municipality to make that happen. Part one of our project, as I've said, is to create the first statue of real women in Central Park, New Yorkers Stanton and Anthony. But that statue is only the first of many that we'll propose throughout New York City. Part two includes a women's history education campaign to tell the stories of all women, all the incredible women that our history books and history classes omitted. And we're in partnership with the New York Historical Society to create new curriculum and online resources for students and teachers, as well as programs, conferences, and ex exhibitions for the public. Part three is the challenge to municipalities that I referenced. And the timing is right as we get ready to celebrate the National Women's Suffrage Centennial and the 200th anniversary of the birth of Susan B. Anthony, both in 2020. New York City could be at the center of the nation's celebration of those two monumental events in 2020, and we would be pleased to work with the City Council to make that happen. We're also pleased to announce today that the Statue Fund has successfully reached our $1.5 million budget goal for the first phase of our efforts. We thank the over 1,000 individual donors who've supported us, as well as foundations and companies like the Ford Foundation, the American Express Foundation, the Jane Walker Campaign, and Old Navy, who see the vital importance of our work. We especially want to extend our thanks to New York Life for both the extraordinary $500,000 challenge grant and for believing in us. The only city money we have received came from a $100,000 capital fund grant from Manhattan Borough President Gail Brewer, who has been our steadfast supporter, and from a member item from Council Member Helen Rosenthal, for which we're very grateful. We also thank the members of the Council's Women's Caucus for two wonderful letters of support we've received over the last several years. So I'm Brenda Berkman, and I'm a retired New York City fire captain, and I'm a, a member of the board of directors of the Statue Fund and Monumental Women. And as Pam said, we are a nonprofit uh, charity, completely privately funded. And I'm going to, there's been a lot of questions today about what is the process for getting a work of art into a public park. And I want to give you a few details about our process so you understand the great difficulty that we have we have had in terms of over five years trying to make this happen. So first we had to, you know, challenge the New York City governmental bureaucracy and it's often unwritten rules and I was very pleased to hear the questioning from the City Council about making the, the process way more transparent. It's not easy to donate a work of art to the City of New York, especially when that work of art is of real women. We want to give you several quick examples of the many challenges. First, the Parks Department and the New York City Park Conservancy said absolutely not to adding a statue of real women to Central Park, arguing that the statues in Central Park represent a historical collection and will be no, no new ones. We persisted. Then they said, why don't you pick another park? Are you sure you want a statue? Why not a garden? We persisted. Then they said something that the advocates of past Central Park statues never were told. We should find evidence of Anthony and Stanton actually being in Central Park. We found that evidence. Then thanks to Parks Commissioner Mitchell S Silver, the statue was approved, but was given a location on the outskirts of the park. 
We persisted and a beautiful site on the mall was dedicated on November 6, 2017. In addition, we've had to adhere to rules requiring our statue to match the 19th century aesthetic of the other statues on the mall. Finally, the many very strict requirements for placement of the statue on the mall were ironed out. Then came our interaction with the Public Design Commission, which started last October. From the very beginning, our intent with the statue design competition was to find a compelling way of including many con contributing voices from the suffrage movement, in addition to those of Stanton and Anthony. Our jury was selected to bring a diverse set of viewpoints to the process, and those jury members unanimously selected the design of nationally known artist Meredith Bergman. Parks, Central Park Conservancy, and the Public Design Commission representatives were involved in the entire time. Only late last year did we hear any reservations about the current design, and it appears that we want, if we want to have PDC approval, we need to remove some of the aspects of the design we believe to be the most inclusive, especially the 22 additional quotes on the scroll in the ballot box. We, of course, want PDC approval. Hi, thank you. Hi, my name is Judlyn Cassidy. I'm a plumber from Plumbers Union um, Number One, and I'm the founder of a nonprofit called Tools and Tiaras. And recently, we we were pleased that the PDC Commission stated most emphatically that they believe that Anthony and Stanton were certainly deserving of being honored in their own right with a statue in Central Park as abolitionists, suffrage, and women's rights pioneers. The PDC commissioners said that no number of individuals, no matter how wordy, could truly represent a whole movement. Thus, in effort, in an effort to complete our original goal of honoring all women, we, we now offer another idea to the city council. We propose that New York City create a women's rights trails, encompassing all the five boroughs. This trail will consist of statues, garden, plaques, street signs, and historic homes, museums, ex exhibitions, and other tributes to honor the diversity of women, especially those who fought for suffrage and for women's rights. We look forward to working with many partners, including the city council and the newly created She Built New York to make New York City, City Women's Rights Trail a reality. And um, thank you so much for your time and uh, looking forward to working with you. Thank you so much for being here today. Um, we may have some questions for you, so, but first we're gonna hear from uh, Ms. Ali. Yes, thank you so much for having me. Give a man a fish and he eats for a day. Give a woman a fish and she'll probably ask you where, she's got, where you got it from so she can feed her tribe. I am Amina Ali, I'm a naturopathic doctor, and I represent UN Women for the Gambia. Um, I am a Gulf War veteran, and I am a Muslim African-American woman living here in New York. I come representing sovereign tribes, international cultures, and the voice of the indigenous people of New York. And I speak to the point that women are the first teachers in all religions, as nurturing is the first lesson learned. Independent moms, and we're getting away from the single moms because her marital status has nothing to do with her parenting. But independent moms raise the children regardless of accompaniment because she realizes that that is her sworn duty to that child. Even sports greats often seem to shout out, hi mom, when in camera view. So consciously or unconsciously, women are wanting to be inclusive, not be a part of anything. Because we are the first teachers of this language in any religion, any culture, or any tribe, the value and the importance of women are seen. It is only when we come into a political or a uh, transgressed governmental entity that it is seems that that lesson or that view is askewed. Um, it is important that we remember this in our communities as we are the ones that are favored to the um, 
respective times that we have in our community. For example, most women go to grocery stores, they go to parks. They are outside in the communal life uh, more often than men are as they are the breadwinners and subsequent, subsequently traditionally was at work most of the time. So it only makes sense that if we're in the community um, as, as women, as representatives, that we see things that represent us. Since we are the ones that are given the opportunity to be in that space and occupy that at most, why is it that we have to be reminded of those that may not be there all the time? I think that most of us that will agree that when we come in front or come in view of things we do culturally and tribally, women are the number one piece uh, that we see. But more importantly and more to the point, approving of this will open the doors for representations of those in the military that I've yet to hear mention in this panel. Um, those that are of indigenous cultures and are indigenous traditions as well as sovereign traditions. Um, these are things that will hopefully open the door and open the way to us having those representations as well. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Ms. Ali, and I want to thank you all. Uh, it's quite shocking to me um, Central Park is one of the world's great public spaces uh, that, and there are many, many statues there and I've had this conversation uh, with both of my co-chairs today. It's shocking to me that there is not a single statue of a woman who actually existed who didn't have to be created as a fictional work of art. Um, so uh, I don't know uh, if Councilman Van Bramer or Councilwoman Rosenthal have questions at this time. Um. No. Okay. Uh, actually, sorry, quick question. Um, first of all, uh, um, I do have a quick question. No. Just for the Monument Committee, are you guys clear about what your next steps are? Well, the three-part program that I initiated uh, in terms of a discussion <laughs> is the whole continuation. You know, this statue's only the first one. We are going to have many others. The Women's History Education Campaign has already started, and you'll see the rollout of it as we get closer and closer to the unveiling of our statue on the Mall on August 26, 2020. The challenge to municipalities all across the country will happen that very day when we have the unveiling ceremony, and it will continue as long as we can privately fundraise to keep ourselves going. As I've said, we're all volunteers. Uh, by the time of the unveiling, we'll, we will have spent seven years of our lives trying to make this happen, but we're committed to spend a lifetime to increase the awareness and the appreciation of women's history and the history of all women. I should have started by saying thank you. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I would like to finish by saying thank you. And we want to work with the council because there's so much together we could do to make this celebration in 2020 quite remarkable. And the council could help take the lead on that. And we would join you in full partnership. So Pam is too modest to say this, but many years ago, she not only uh, spearheaded the street naming out here for Stanton and Anthony, but also put together for Manhattan this list of 120 women's history sites. And it's because she was working in Manhattan, right, for Manhattan politicians. But we anticipate that we would like to do similar kinds of things for the other boroughs, recognizing, unfortunately, uh, Council Member Cumbo left, but recognizing that Queens, Brooklyn, Staten Island, the Bronx have been left out of the equation in many cases, and at least being able to push and work with those communities to recognize women and people of color in their public spaces. So this is, you know, this is sort of old school now. Not that it's not needed, but, but I've been working with projects like talking statues and digital work, and then of course with the New York Historical Society and with Wikipedia. So I would urge the council not only to look, look at how do we physically memorialize women and people of color in public spaces, but then how do we provide the full accounting of history about why those things are there. How many monuments have you walked by and you have no idea who these people are, right? And so can we educate the public in many different perspectives, not from many pr different perspectives, not just 
putting a piece of rock or bronze there, but also doing the hard work to bring forth uh, the actual history of these people. I guess I was asking, so I agree with you and thank you. Um, I was asking a sort of simplistic question of, um, uh, are, is the monument fund yourselves? Are you on a track to move forward that is clear, a, a path forward clear? that's clear now? Well, we're very clear on it. <laughs> well, the, the short answer to a long process, uh, we enter our sixth year, is that uh, you heard testimony earlier today saying that the public design, uh, the public design commission only takes two or three months. We're in uh, month number five and counting. You know, uh, what we've described to you in a very brief way has uh, demonstrated obstacles at every possible step. And at this point, who wouldn't agree that we need more statues of women? We're supplying the money. We're supplying the work. Everybody's working with us pro bono. Why can't we get some cooperation? And so does PDC have an end date? Have they told you this will come out of the commission? in the next two months or? Well, we know their next hearing, which we have applied to be on the agenda, is uh, March 18th. Okay. We're hopeful that they can combine both a conceptual and preliminary level of approval at that hearing, but we have not heard a response to our request for that yet. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Um, to answer your question, there are plenty of statues that I have to go back when I'm touring I'm a parks chair, so I, I get to a lot of parks, and there are people I have literally never, forget about, I've never heard of them, let alone know what they did or what they stood for. And, and that may be because, you know, some of these statues have been in place for over 100 years, and um, they did not hold up to the scrutiny of history, or they just, you know, they may still be important to people, but they're just not as well known as they might have been um, a long, long time ago. Uh, we have been joined by uh, two of our colleagues, uh, Councilman Andy King uh, from the great borough of my birth, the Bronx, and Councilman Eric Ulrich from my home borough of Queens. And C Councilman King wanted to make a statement. Yes, thank you, Mr. Chair. And I appreciate you because the way you treat Sparks is like you treat your home and you take care of it very well, so I say thank you for that. Um, also, I want to just put on the record, I'd like to get an idea from you all as you've advocated for statues, and this is something I would like to see the council get more engaged in of how do we able to be a part of funding statues ourselves if we're not at that level of work. Because, um, no one's ever said to me, hey, listen, can you help us fund a statue of so-and-so or such of this person we're trying to, you know, get a statue built up. The city of New York is very diverse, as we always say it is. Um, then all our statues, wherever they are, art should reflect that in every way and not being afraid to tell the story of New York or the world. As bad as some of it is, there's a lot of greatness in it as well. And I would definitely like to see, you know, my nine-year-old granddaughter walk down the street and see a statue of someone she can appreciate because it's a reflection of her story as well. We know what it is. America one day did not look at everyone the same. So we're not reflected in some of the statues, you know, kind of put us all on blast when you start telling the story of who that person actually is. Then we find out the name of that school, the name of that person, how they actually live, you know, essentially uh, is demoralizing and unacceptable today. So we need to make sure that we have artwork that's reflective, tells our story, but us not being afraid to say this is, this is, these are the great things in the city of New York, and these are some of the things that we're not proud of, but everyone needs to know, know about it so we can move forward. When we try to throw stuff underneath the rug, it's that underlying energy, negative energy that always surfaces when we don't talk about something. So having these monuments um, and statues being built to tell our story, I think it's a great way to reflect and educate ourselves. Would you be able to tell me in all the advocacy work and the, the money that you use, how long, I know the system takes a minute to get stuff done sometimes, um, but if you were to say I wanted to erect a statue, how long would you think it would take for you to get a statue built after finding a location and, and getting it erected? Well, the plan that we have, and we're very fortunate to have project managers, uh, the highly respected firm of Buyer Blinder Bell, 
right now, because there's been such a delay with the Public Design Commission, we're behind schedule. We need to have approval and move forward to the development of the full statue. We've had the maquette, we're working on the one-third size figure and moving to the large uh, figure and then go to the foundry and all the other steps. The short answer is, if we get that design uh, approval immediately, we can make our deadline of August 26. So we issued our RFQ, RFP on November 6, 2017. We selected uh, the winner in July uh, of 2018. We are moving forward with the approvals and it takes two more years from that time. So I would say realistically four years. Four years. And, and Council Member King, keep in mind too that you know our our project is privately funded for the most part. Okay. And for a lot of communities, it's gonna take them a long time to raise that money. We were very fortunate to be able to raise $1.5 million that was needed in order to both construct and then maintain the statue in Central Park, plus do our education campaign. So the money raising part for private groups can be quite daunting. GoFundMe or whatever you know, <laughs> aside. But if, but if you uh, add this, the help of the city council and the active participation and advocacy of New York City government, you can cut the four years to two. Right, and that's why I say to Mr. Chair, let's figure out, Mr. Chair, how do we come together as a council to offer fund support? And maybe we can look to erect five new statues in each borough you know, doing, doing our tenure here to say that we're doing our part and, and, and streamline, fast track this stuff. So there's no reason stuff needs to, when we know it's the right thing to do, we shouldn't, be, our bureaucracy should get in the way of us doing the right thing. So I want to thank you, Mr. Chair, for leading today's conversation. And thank you, ladies, for all your advocacy and what y'all doing and speaking truth to power. Thank you. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Councilman you. King. I want to thank this panel um, for their uh, insight and for your work, especially um, Captain Berkman, for your service to the city of New York as a fire captain. I know that is uh, a very, very difficult job and a one of great distinction. Um, I want to thank you all for being here today. I want to thank uh, my co-chairs, uh, Helen Rosenthal of the Women's Committee and uh, Jimmy Van Bramer of that committee with a very long name. <laughs> and uh, I also want to uh, know that we are going to enter into the record testimony of Manhattan Borough President Gail Brewer. Um, which she gave before the Public Design Commission on October 15, 2018, and two letters uh, from the Women's Caucus of the City Council from the last term of the City Council, um, one on June 20th, 2017. Okay, one second. I think someone has something to add. Okay. If we could just recognize her. Ms. Ali, did you want to add something? I, I, actually, it's kind of out of place now, but more to the council. Um, Council Member's point, um, it's, you, you talked about uh, community and that we are community, but I remember um, Ellis Island was mentioned um, as a reminder, which is another statue of a woman, um, <laughs> that is a reminder of the communities that came aboard these shores. And because of that, we were um, more inclusive as a people in those communities. I remember a time when we used to represent Miss Johnson's baby girl or Miss Jackson's young one, and now we're representing communities. I'm from Brooklyn, I'm from the Bronx, so we kind of lost that efficacy of, of representing family and what we were. And I think that holds a great tangent to the communities and the um, cultures that I represent to be able to bring that back together and to be a cohesive need and have a statue in your community that represents your community. Um, and I don't see how hard that is if the people are um, uh, duly noted to be able to be represented. And I think that's the bigger piece, that we're not really represented as a truth, we're represented as a demographic of fact. So it's not really um, tangible to see how people have the power that we're asking for if we're not seen as the people that we, you mentioned in history that weren't represented initially when the rules of engagement were written. So I think sometimes we have to see that and understand that in partnership with what it is that we're designing, that if we don't see people as human, there isn't a humanistic factor. I relent. I thank you for that. Um, I just want to add that um, in addition to Borough President Brewer's testimony, uh, we're going to enter into the record two uh, letters from the Women's Caucus of the previous term of the council dated June 20th. Um, it was addressed to uh, Mayor de Blasio and Commissioner Silver, and another letter of October 6, 2014, also addressed to Mayor de Blasio and Commissioner Silver uh, about this topic. 
At this time, um, seeing no other questions from this panel, I want to thank everybody who is here today and for advancing uh, this conversation along. Uh, you can be sure that uh, we'll be following this uh, most intensely and uh, we look forward to working with everybody who participated today um, to diversifying our monuments and our statues to be more reflective of this great city of New York. And with that, at uh, 1243, I am going to close this hearing. Thank you all.